Welcome to Oil & Whiskey, an Ironclad Original. I am Josh Henning. I'm Phil Gerber. I'm Jeremy Gerber. Welcome, everybody, back to Oil & Whiskey, an Ironclad Original. Today's guest is TV host, automotive journalist, and creator of The Late Break Show, Johnny Smith. We've also got another episode of Roadster Shop Hall of Fame. Possibly. Maybe. We'll see. You have to stay around to the end for that. It's a waiting we'll game. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't discussed what the Hall of Fame will be yet, so. It'll be exciting when we see yeah, it. Yeah, it'll be a little surprise <laughs> to all of us. Uh, all right. Today's guest has been an automotive journalist for more than 20 years and featured in such international publications as Car, Octane, FHM, GQ, Max Power, and Auto Car. He's also hosted several BBC TV shows to include Fifth Gear, Motorheads, and Mud, Sweat, and Gears. Today, Johnny Smith is best known as the creator of the Late Break Show YouTube channel and website. He also co-hosts the popular Smith and Sniff podcast. It's a pretty good name. Smith and Sniff. <laughs> Johnny is also That's a prolific right. collector, having owned more than 130 cars, including Japanese imports, American muscle cars, and Eastern European imports. You can check out Johnny Smith on Instagram and YouTube at The Late Break Show. Johnny Smith, welcome to Oil and Whiskey. Thank you for having me. It's exciting. This is, man. This is, uh, this is going to be cool. It's, it's, it sounds glamorous, me having 130 or cars over the years, but I, I'm going to be honest, most of them were rubbish. Uh, I mean, there's I, been, there's been, I'd say maybe 20 of those are impressive <laughs> at the most. I, I know it, man. When, when people ask us about like, oh, you guys got a big hot rod shop. You must have a really great car collection. Like I have tons of cars. I'm like, well, yeah, I think, and we probably got like, yeah, there's like 40 or 50 of them, but and like 10 or 12 of them are sitting out in the lawn incapacitated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think they, yeah, amongst that whole group, cars. there's, there's one or two that you might be able to get in and drive, but yeah, no, I, I feel your pain. I know where you're That's at. That's exactly that. it. It's yeah. it's how many are functioning. That's always a completely different percentage. How many cars you got, how many work. Right. Mm. The uh the the accent is is throwing me off a little bit. It's cause it's you can tell he knows what he's talking about based on the accent. I wonder if We've people got. hear <laughs> if they hear me talk, they're like, Oh, that dude must know what he's talking we, about. He, no, 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 no. You know, We've got polar so. opposites here because yeah, the British accent you associate with like Intelligence, intelligence, yeah. And <laughs> yeah. Now, now you, on the other hand, yeah. I mean, I no disrespect out there, but Josh <laughs> here's from Alabama, yeah. so. Uh, <laughs> you know. Oh, but it's well, all one good. of my no, it's like one of my good friends. Um, is um, he builds hot rods? Um, called PJ and he Bircher, and he is based in Tennessee. Yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. might know? You might know. Um, yeah. B rod um, and custom. Yeah, he PJ guy. built the ice cream truck back back in the day. That's right. Yeah, yep. yeah, that's right. And he's doing a lot of stuff with the uh, the classic Corvette bodies and things. And he um he he always made a joke to me. He always said that he sounds like the most stupid person you're ever going to meet. But he's actually one of the most switched on, sharp guys in the in this business that I've met. And he's lovely. So I won't judge. Also, if I sound intelligent, it doesn't mean I am. I'm pretty <laughs> sure I'm not. Well, I'll I'd pretend. Like- I'd like to Thank say the same goes it. for me. If That's I it. if I sound stupid, I'm probably not. But yeah, well, yeah no comment. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll just get right into it. Yeah, yes, he sure will. Uh, yeah, so on, on the intro, they called them uh, European imports. Are they considered European imports? Where Eastern, you're from? Eastern European imports. Okay. So it'd be coming from Eastern Europe into Central Europe, I guess. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, we've had. There's been a couple of Eastern Europe. Well, I bought my brother for his 40th birthday a Trabant because he loves two-stroke cars. And um, they're quite amusing. I don't know if you've ever had a poke around a Trabant before, but it's it's unusual. Don't I've never even heard, I've never heard of a two-stroke car. I mean, two-stroke dirt bikes. <laughs> two stroke sure. car, yeah, two-stroke yeah. car. Yeah. So even the deluxe model didn't get a fuel gauge. It had a dipstick for the fuel tank. Oh. Um, very, very big, like a twin, a vertical twin, air-cooled front wheel drive transverse leaf spring i think body made out of uh reconstituted cotton fibers a mad you know pre berlin wall falling down um kind of eastern german thing hmm. and uh yeah and, yeah, and i bought that's quite a piece there kind of yeah. looks like the car you'd see on like a merry-go-round ride <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's like the car from uh, that cartoon, The Incredibles, 
uh, it's the, the Mr. Incredible drives. It, c- it can't really fit in it. it. It looks really similar to that. What size wheels are those? Are those like 12s? 12s. I think they are 12s, actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's very light. It's almost like a little uh, Datsun 510, but maybe a little smaller. Yes. Like that, but engineered on a much smaller budget, I would say. <laughs> but, <okay. laughs> East, yeah. East Germany, Trabant. Quite the unit right there. East German Trabant, yeah, yeah. So th- they stopped making those in 1991, the year after the Berlin Wall fell down, uh, or tw- 18 months after the Berlin Wall. So I bought my brother one the month that the Berlin Wall fell down. It's one of the last of the two strokes, which in, in the Trabant community, that's quite a thing. So the, oh, he's got the one. He's so the, the Berlin one. Wall comes down and they're like, you know what? It's about time. We're fixing to show the world what we got. You know, we're fixing to get after it. And <laughs> and that was and that was what they brought to the table. I think the Berlin Wall fell down and they re- they saw what was on the other side, like Volkswagen Golfs that were actually quite good, like Golf GTIs and, right. and BMW M5s. And they were like, shit, we can't compete with this. Yeah, let's just get something <laughs> done. Get it out there. Uh, yeah, but mission, mission abort. <laughs> mission abort. <laughs> They so, put a VW engine in it, but it wasn't as good. Tell us a little bit about your uh, upbringing and uh, and your background and how you got into uh, this crazy world that we laugh at and all are waiting to uh, get caught. Like, cause we all could be having a real job, you know. Let's face sure. it, we're we're doing something that's pretty fun. So, very much so. I think I st- I started. I, I I realized at school and probably at college that I was good at English and I wanted to do, I I loved magazines. So pre-internet, loved car magazines, couldn't get enough of them. If anyone was ever going to another country, I'd always try and get them to bring a car mag back. And used to love watching films just for the car content, regardless of the storyline. And you'd have, I'd have like a photographic memory. We'd remember what cars were where in everything from like old episodes of Columbo to the latest film. And then um, decided, I thought, well, um, w- what should I do? And started to study sort of media studies and things like that. And then eventually I went to university and ended up getting my foot in the door as a sort of junior writer on a mag, a car mag, um, a one make car mag, which was a, like a classic Volkswagen air called Volkswagen magazine. And then, um, that's, that was my, that was my start of, of, of my career really. And then gradually worked on various different titles, classic car titles, mainstream automotive stuff, and then went um, freelance and then kind of fell into television sort of by accident. But again, doing um, always cars. My hobby's always been car, uh, classic cars traditionally and custom cars. And then my business became more new cars. So that was the kind of yin and yang going on in my head. And then um, fast forward to kind of, I don't know, the last seven years, been doing more on YouTube as that's grown as a, as a, as a media, mostly doing content for other people. And then um, decided, this, this was pre-COVID, about, eight, about six weeks pre-COVID, decided to go at it alone, create my own brand, and finally kind of be free from the constraints of any TV commissioners or anybody else and just do the car content the vehicle content that I wanted to do myself. So maybe selfishly, I don't know, but, um, and then, so in, in all that time, since the late nineties, when I started on car magazines, I've done, I've had various projects or there's always a car or two that need working on or finishing, or I get distracted and I buy another one. And, and yeah, I've always had a bit of a fascination for American cars. So I'm a bit unusual in that, I always aspired to own an American car in Britain, which is unusual. And then, but I, but I also like really tiny cars as well. So at one point, you know, I had a Cadillac and a a bubble car at the same time, which is about as (laughs) far away from one another as you could possibly get. So, um, yeah. And I can, to this day that, that those, those interests have never escaped me. So I've got one eye on the future of cars, electric cars and what's coming next. And on the other, I am looking at what's, already been what is the next kind of resto mod what car do i uh fancy or what should i just stop looking at and finish what i've already got which i've got i've got many unfinished projects i have had so not i'm to, easily distracted not to sound too stupid but how, can 
What's it like driving a Cadillac over there? I mean, obviously, I mean, that's be difficult in the city. I mean, you have to pretty much be out on the country roads, don't <laughs> making, you? Making three point turns around town with okay, this thing. Probably. I mean, parking spots aren't even uh, the size. No, of they're not. It. Yeah, they're not. No, they're not. It's not. It's too big for the for the for the the town. I mean, <laughs> I owned the Cadillac when I lived in London just for fun because I didn't need a car every day. I used to cycle to work because it was quicker than driving actually. So at the weekend, I'd have this. It was a seventy six. Fleetwood, so it was a 500 cubic inch big bastard thing, <laughs> and um, and it was really cheap because um, I bought it from a, a like a film company. They'd used it for a small film, mm-hmm. and someone had painted it with a roller. It was terrible. <laughs> it's a real nice job, it, then. Huh? It, yeah. yeah, it was really, it was really quite shabby. But it was all there. It ran. It was cheap, and I thought it's just an itch I've got to scratch. So I had that. That's that 76 Fleetwood for a while. And it was quite amusing driving that around London. But like you say, it didn't really fit. It didn't fit anywhere. Um, and uh, But I've still, I've ever since then, actually, I've had a, 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 a one American car at some point. Um, and I quite like the challenge of driving left-hand drive. I don't know if you guys have ever driven a right-hand drive in the US, but it's that challenge of positioning the car on the road and... It's a bit odd. Well, you guys have the postal trucks, which are right-hand drive, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Those, yeah and we've got I, I, we've got a couple employees that embrace the yeah. right-hand drive. They want the, 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 the little Mitsubishi uh, Pajero. Pajero. Oh, Pajero, yeah. nice. Yeah. It's like yeah. modded out. It's pretty trick. Chris, our designer, he's got uh, <laughs> he's from Scotland, right? Yep. And uh, he's got a uh, uh, Defender. Defender. Oh, nice. Yeah. So they, well, they're yeah. harder to drive around in London than a Cadillac, I'd say. Is the turning circle in the Cadillac? I, the Cadillacs crack me up when you said you had a '76 Cadillac and you said it's it's too big for this town. I feel like whoever yes. bought that car in '76, that's what they were thinking. Yeah, like that's like the, <laughs> I feel like that's Cadillac, <laughs> the marketing model. Yeah, too big for this town. It'd be a good country song. <laughs> it would. <laughs> it, I can't it, stop it, thinking about it? that. Man. It would yeah. be good for a good, good country song. Yeah. It, 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 it was one of those cars where I think it was when I read about it when I first bought it. It said it was the biggest post-war Cadillac ever made, non-stretch. And and I bought it. I'm trying to remember. I paid so like 200 pounds. It was really small amount of money. And um, I sold it to a guy who lived on a boat. I remember that. And I said, "Why? Why? What do you want? What do you want it for?" He said, "Oh, I'm going on holiday with some friends to Scotland. Actually, we're going to tour around Scotland, and, and there's six of us, and we can fit in this easily, and all our stuff, no problem. Don't need a roof box, don't need a trailer. So they were just going to use the Cadillac for this big road trip, and um, I kind of miss it. But I, uh, I've, there's a lot. I mean, not to hang on the Cadillac too much, but and no, <laughs> no offense, but you don't. You've got a uh, a look that you could be from a lot of different places in the world. Um, yes, and. You driving around in London in this big Cadillac. I mean, the stories people probably <laughs> told themselves like, "What? You just needed like a like a left." Don't, yeah, don't look him. Don't look him in the eye. Don't, don't look Do him not in, look yeah, him yeah, right in the eye. eye. <laughs> you know, it's re- it's really funny you should say that because um, that was the car that no one would make eye contact with me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I used to, I used to pull up to the lights in it and I would turn like this. And then just stare without without <laughs> blinking to see how long it would take for that person. To, and, and they they never looked at me. They knew they knew I was looking at them, but they never looked back. So I just used to do that. Wait for the lights in the corner of my eye to go green, and then just kind of smoke off. Yeah. And it was it was a weird. I mean, it was a bit of a. It did look a bit like the sort of car you might get kidnapped in in an old film. Oh yeah. So it was a bit creepy, but uh, it was fun. It was really good fun. What American just cars? Money on it. What American cars do you have now? Uh, today, I've got um, a, a Dodge Charger and a Chevrolet Impala. So I kind of I've got the two American cars which I always aspired to own. Uh, that the 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 Impala is the never ending story. It's still not finished. It's been the longest, most drawn out project of my life. But I've I'm I'm in too deep now. I can't turn back. What's the so culture I'm, like on as far as like daily drivers and and driving around the? I feel like the you know the the old joke is you know most of the world looks at America as you know fat overweight everything's in excess too much horsepower <laughs> too much you know everything like that and you're driving around in a you know you said a Hellcat or, you know or yeah what's the what's the overall like vibe on you just driving that parking it and people like. Is that accepted? Oh, like, is it cool? Is it, or is it like, like key in the car and throwing paint yeah. on it? 
No, I think I think right now it's it's okay. I mean, it's accepted that you wouldn't drive a car like a a classic Charger in Britain every day. You'd be mad, and you'd you'd be broke. So it's a treat when people when you see it out. And I think I've noticed that the sort of demographic of people that appreciate it more has got younger over the years. I was expecting it to get older, but I think because of those cars appearing in certain key um films and maybe tv commercials and owned by famous people and also a lot of people who collect lots of exotic cars you know they go through the phase of i've I've had the lamborghinis and i've got the mclarens and i've got the ferraris and i've got the porsches and they all they sometimes come back round to like well what what about more kind of attainable kind of working class fun stuff and that usually is either you get british cars from the 60s and 70s like escort mexicos and things that are a bit cheeky and and then you call you get american muscle and i think i've noticed in the last decade if i turn up at a like a cars and coffee type show that mostly has european or supercars at it that my car will just get so many admiring looks and i get people from in ferraris coming to me to want to talk to me about my car whereas i think before it was a bit like if you drive an american car in the uk you have to dress like either elvis or willie nelson and <laughs> they expect you to live the cliche you know and it's like no no i, I don't i'm not going to dress like a cowboy i just like a dodge charger that's all so the char- yeah. charger and an impala were those driven by like movies i mean was it like bullet and boys in the yeah. hood that you grew up watching and you're like that's <laughs> what i need i'm i gotta have <laughs> yeah, one of those yeah. <laughs> you know? You've, you've hit the nail on the head. I think the chart, the chart, obviously the, the, the Dukes of, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in my about, about to turn my mid forties. So I think Dukes of Hazard was, was a big influence in the eighties, along with all the other eighties greats, like a team and sure. all that stuff, Ghostbusters and Knight Rider. So, but I remember that the general Lee was always amazing and is always fun. And it still is actually, but um, as I got a bit older and I, my dad introduced me to bullet, I remember one day my dad saying to me, cause he knew me and my brother used to love cars. And of course you couldn't, we didn't have a VCR. So we, if a film was on, you had to just watch it and that was it. Right. Yeah. Um, and my dad said tonight, I'm going to let you guys stay up late. If you want to, there's, there's a film on that you should watch. It's got the long, the world's longest car chase in it. And we were both like, we're in, okay, let's do this. And he tried to explain it that, you know, earlier on in the day, and then we watched it and I was just blown away by it. I didn't know who Steve McQueen was. And um, I didn't really know much about the plot because I was too old, uh, too young. But the, the, I think the Charger still, is, it just has so many interesting shapes to it. And I always thought that's a car I've got to own at some point. But I also really like the earlier Chargers, you know, the first generation Chargers. So I, I, uh, when I originally started looking for a car, uh, like a muscle car, I started looking for roadrunners or first gen chargers. And I thought I'll just try and find the, the right condition car for the right money and just see what's out there. And uh, I, ended, I ended up nearly buying a, a 68 roadrunner 383 manual, weirdly. It's the same 383 manual as my, as my charger, but um, and it didn't happen. But yeah, so all of those cars were always on my kind of radar. And yeah, the, the Impala was completely boys in the hood. And then I became obsessed with <laughs> Dude, the I'm on, rider thing. I'm on fire you now. Are, you are on fire oh, You are. You, you tele, your telepathy is yeah, yeah, no, really working. I'm in your head. <laughs> and it's, and it, yeah. So of course, and then listening to all the, all that kind of gangster rap with references to six fours all the time. And I thought, yeah. And I had, I, I've actually had two 64 Impalas. The first one was, this the one I've got. The one I've spent all the money and time on is a, is an SS. But the first car I got was a factory right hand drive four door hardtop. So it had been in this country since nearly new, and it was probably a rarer car. But it's just less desirable because it's not a two door. It's not an SS. It's and 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 I and I really since then I miss that car, but. I've got quite into finding factory right-hand drive American cars because there's a there's sort of pockets of them, but they never really get the the t- the, m- the money and time and recognition that they deserve because they they were really expensive cars when they were sold. You know, if you had a 
you know, like in 1967, if you bought a brand new Ford Galaxy right-hand drive in London, like you were you were a rock star. Hmm. And 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 they, there weren't many around. And my dad said to me, if you ever saw a right-hand drive American car, like that was it. That person was obviously important. That was not just an average woman or or guy. And and, I, and I've subsequently owned a couple of right-hand drives, including a Pontiac. My friend owns it now. It, unfortunately, it's a wreck. You guys need to restore it. It's terrible. It's a ter- terrible state. It's a '66 Pontiac. You know that Pontiac Two Plus Two project oh, that I saw sure. on yeah. your. A ca- it's a Catalina? convertible. It's it's a Parisian. Oh, a pre a Parisian a '66 Parisian Cabriolet. Uh, what is it? Two eighty three. Two eighty three f- Power Glide. But yeah, it's a great great car. It deserves a full resto though. Poor thing. It's lived in Britain too long. It's a bit crumbly. How, how easy is it to come across American cars out there, classic American cars? Is it something that you can jump on, like, Facebook Marketplace and start digging around and here's one right down the street? Or is it you, like... You, you can. Yeah. You, wow. you, I mean, since since the internet, obviously, everything's a lot easier. There's a magazine that's been going for, like, forever in the UK called Classic American. And that was the mag that I used to pick up because it was your sort of your, your Bible of... UK and European American car clubs, feature cars, and where you buy these these bits. So, if you if you go through that, or you go to um, a couple of car shows, there's there's all often a sort of a legion of American car owners. But there's a there's a couple of dedicated American car shows around the UK, and surprisingly big. There was a massive hot rod show last year. Um, I forget how many people attended it, but I, I did. I did go there. I did a little video for the Late Break Show, actually, and it was um, a huge gathering of thirty-two Fords, mostly, but everything and anything, pro street stuff. And we, we, there, there's a, there's a off the side of that, the American car scene. There is a there's a small but really dedicated drag racing scene in the UK, and we get a lot of Europeans coming over to compete. Here too, you know, a lot of Belgians, Germans, Scandinavians who are really pretty good, as you probably know, they're well into their hot rods. And so they come over and we get to see quite a lot of um, cars that way. So through the American car kind of community, I have met some fantastic like drag race, privateer drag race guys, and they've built some great stuff. But I think some of the American cars that have arrived here have come via the us air force the us bases so where i am where i'm in the middle of the country basically where i live and there's two big american us air force bases and historically that they they can bring whatever they want over you know they get their cars air air freighted over so i I made friends with one 15 years ago a guy that had brought his impala over and he was doing work on it and used to drive it around and he said if you ever need any parts tell me and here's my like a us military address order it with your with my military address and they they air freight it free of taxes within about two days of you ordering it so it's like shit yes. okay if you, if you ever so, want to do anything crooked you, you can always chassis. count on the american government you know <laughs> <laughs> well, I was say, the, 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 the american government definitely kept did them proud but for, for certainly for getting mechanical stuff it's always been quite easy but for for bigger stuff you know, like bonnets and f- doors and trim and all the big stuff is much harder to get. So is it, this is going to be, I'm sure probably wildly offensive. To, <laughs> so to go, the, go ahead yeah. with it. <laughs> um, this is Lead just with it. from, you from say, an American you with all due respect. Yeah, with all due respect. No, from <laughs> why, why is it that, like you said, Scandinavian, uh, the Swedes, why, they've always, at least as long as I've been around in, in the high rod scene, um, custom motor co- motorcycles and stuff, they've always had way more hardcore, badass, uh, you know, fenderless, a lot of stuff that we were doing over here. If you were going to be like, you know, outlaw motorcycle clubs and stuff like that, they were, they were just hardcore. Whereas, yeah. you know, in England, it's always, is that just been forever centuries of the, <laughs> being proper, the high browness of, you know, we're going to be a little bit, you know, I think they're they're definitely like way above us in motorsports, you know. But yeah. when you get into the Scandinavian stuff, they're just trying to like mimic the American culture just, of like the outlaw. They've just always look. been yeah. way more badass than anything that you see come out of. You know, England has always been way more 
you know, you've got cafe racers and you polite. get the thing. It's everything way more polite. It's just we are a bit more reserved than polite. We kind of we 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 go there, but then we sort of apologize if we're gonna if we're gonna be an outlaw, <laughs> we'll apologize first. I guess so. You. Yeah, there is a I think the great thing about the Scandinavians, I think, is they've just they're they're, they're I don't know, their culture is so fascinating because on the one hand, they're very cu- quite clean living, really into renewable energy. Obviously, the the their lifestyle they have a good standard of living and they're all like sexy people, right? Yeah. They're all good looking. I've good never looking. met a bad looking Scandinavian yeah, right. man they, or they, woman. They fuck with some furniture too, man. I mean, that's, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So they yes, and they've just got that great eye for style. It's almost effortless to them. And so when they put together a, a, a hot rod or a custom bike or something, I don't know. It just seems extra special. Yeah. And when I went over there, I've been over there to the, some of the American car shows they do. That was a huge one called Vastaris or Vastaris. I mean, it's it's massive. It's a whole town that just gets mobbed by old American cars, loads of fins and chrome. But it's also, again, quite a young thing. You know, there's a lot of men and women under 30, which I just wasn't expecting. And um, I don't know, They, I think their winters, because their winters are long, and they their standard of living is high. They're, I've been in a few of their workshops, and they're insulated, very cosy, their workshops better than my house so they go in there and they really go go to town when they're when they're building and then they and when the sun comes out in the summer they just they're all out there go like bees hmm. they do they, they, they're really great i love i love scandinavia it's a great 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 places yeah what's the uh the daily car scene like where you're at the daily car scene. Daily, weekly, they're like a lot of local cruise nights and cars and coffee type stuff. Oh, uh, um, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's it's pretty vibrant. I mean, the climate, like now being in January and well into winter, people are quite selective about bringing old stuff out if there's ice and um, salt on the roads, because it will, you know, it will destroy your car. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Cheers. I can't. I haven't got a whiskey. I'm afraid, but I. I um. So I think that it, that there's a lot of vibrant kind of well subscribed like casual cars and coffee type meets. There's workshops that open up themselves to having like a Sunday breakfast kind of club, and when when those things go on, they they're not just like one make type of deals. They they try and be a little bit more welcoming. So. The ones that I personally enjoy the most are where it's a free for all. You'll get one person turning up in a 1920s Alvis and their partner next to a guy in a, you know, an R34 Skyline and they have a chat. They might not own the same car or even fully understand one another, but there's that mutual appreciation of different um, metal. And then, um, and then, and then, yeah, we, there's a lot of racetrack meets because we have quite a lot of racetracks. So I suppose there's, there's quite a lot of um, run what you brungs and um, those sorts of things, and uh, and drifting. Drifting's become like it has in the states. It's become so popular, especially amongst young people. So there's a lot of drifting which goes on, um, and then you have the, you have the more serious motorsport people like you know rally and hill climb and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, the, the the car scene's good. It's it's it, I think it's quite healthy. I think for a small country, it's, it is spookily well subscribed. I said this to someone. I said there's there's forty million cars in this country, and yet it's really not a very big country. I don't know where they all are. I don't know how they fit in what's here. What's the but, What's the stereotypical like boring? That guy just went in and the, said, "I want a car." Like the Toyota Camry. <laughs> the, the, yeah, over here. I was going to say it's, it's the, the it's a two thousand four <laughs> Champagne Toyota Camry over here. Camry. Yeah, yes. same, it's the same thing. There. Is it the same thing there? Well, well we don't get Camrys oh. anymore. I think they, they stopped bringing them in in the late 90s. Oh, but, wow. um, Lucky. The, the equivalent of Camry guy is, um, oh, that's a good one. Probably uh, there's a Vauxhall, like a, what would it be? A, like a Chevy or a, a Buick. Um, oh, in fact, you get it. The Buick, the Buick Regal, which is, okay. um, we have it, it's the Vauxhall Insignia. Hmm. And uh, it's, it's, it's okay, but no, but there's no owners clubs for them. I don't think. I don't think anyone really gives. No one really gives a shit. Yeah. And it's it's not a flamboyant, charismatic car. So that's just a t- a tick box of yeah. I need a car. It does a thing. Yeah. Let's just get it over and done with. Yeah. The Buick. The Buick uh, over here is 
it's traditionally obviously been for a, a way older crowd. They've been doing, yeah. they've been trying to market it, you know, to that hipper audience. Like, oh, it's a Buick. Yeah, it's still a Buick. Yeah. Uh, what, <laughs> the, what's I the, always, I, I've never owned, a, if I ever owned a Buick, I've always wanted a Grand National. Oh, always. And hey, we've got one sitting right behind me here yeah. in the stop showroom. It. Yeah, stop, we just finished one it. up, debuted it at SEMA this year. Yeah. Oh, such a cool car. Yeah. I really a, like those. It's a neat car. This one's uh makes gobs of horsepower. We LS swapped it with twin turbos, but uh, it was uh, like a super clean survivor example of a low mileage, wow. awesome Grand National, which... It's yeah, like I was stoking like, that fire to get the comments. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. I was going to say, sure, but are you, are you looking for trolling? <laughs> a little, a little bit, but that was my first experience ever driving one. I mean, I grew up in that era. I wasn't like a big fan of them back yeah. when I was you know a kid, but uh, it was fun. We kicked that thing around a little bit. It's a little. I mean, you drove it, right? Mm. You drive it? Yeah. It's it's a little, little, it yeah, comes you know, on to let you know it's got a yeah, turbo. It's like and then you're then waiting for like what's about to happen and nothing really happens. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like just enough power to make you realize like, okay, I get like why somebody might want one of these in their stock form, yeah. but yeah, yeah. That's I suppose it's of its time, isn't it? It's so of its time. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's I it's think, got just enough boost to be like, hey, turbo. And then <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. I think the key is to have the original like survivor tires with it too, because that would oh, just, just blow, it'd glaze yeah. them in like, you know, at any speed, just blow them off. But yeah, <laughs> otherwise. I, I got, uh, the, the, it's the kind of car which for years over here, there, there were a couple, but like a couple, they weren't worth very much because nobody really knew about them. And then, um, but a, and a friend of mine has got a, what's the, is it the Cyclone? The uh -huh. GMC Cyclone? Yeah. Or is it the same, same, the Typhoon, which one's the, the one's the pickup and one's the... Yeah, the Cyclone was the pickup. The Typhoon was the little, like, Blazer Jimmy type. Yeah. That's type right. Deal. So he's got that one, I think. Um, and again, that's not a car which you know, anyone really knows about or cares about over here, I don't think. But uh, it's quite a quirky thing. I've, I've never <laughs> driven one. I'd like to drive one. Yeah, we did, but, a, yeah. We did a Typhoon here for a, a local customer, just did, like, upgraded turbo, a little standalone ECU. That's a cool cool little truck it, again it's not fast by any means and you kind of steer on you oh yeah, yeah it, it does like everything's horrible about it basically <laughs> but it looks <laughs> it looks cool the proportions in driving it is crazy because it's like miniature it's yeah. literally it like tiny oh compared to like a modern day suv i mean that was an suv back in that day a mini yes yeah. Well, yeah, yeah yeah a mini suv but you right. sit in that i mean it's miniature but it's uh it's fun like if you kind of like lean on the brake and get it into some boost like brake boost a little bit and get after it. It'll it'll scoot a little bit, but it's uh it's cool. I actually <laughs> want one. I want a Typhoon, like yeah, a, like a daily. Cool. Yeah, I so, think that would be good. Uh, I, I, I like you say that the, the, the they fit in. They're an American car which actually fits in this country because they don't look. They're not American proportions really. Whereas some of the full size stuff is yeah is just silly. You know, I like can't even silly. imagine bringing my Hummer over there. <laughs> especially with that extension you put in it would you put like four feet in the middle of it just enough for another door yeah. Yeah. Four feet. we we joke with josh here that he's uh we picture josh driving like a yellow is it h2 right homer you know lifted yeah. with all the chrome bolt-on goodies so we just, yeah, they're they're stick on they're not bolt on yeah stick yeah. on so we've every <laughs> we utilize cars and st the for, the stereotypes that go along with them. Yeah, for, for profiling. <laughs> That's why I was asking about the Camry stuff. Every every single car we see, we can identify what that guy looks like or girl looks like, what their job is, or vice versa. If you see a guy in a bar, what he's yeah. wearing, you can be like, let's go out there in the parking lot. I guarantee you we can pick out what he's driving. He's the Dodge Ram guy. Yep. Yeah. Dodge Ram guy or the yeah. King's Ranch yeah. guy or the Ranger with a blown out back window. You know, it's just never. <laughs> <laughs> we do that. We do a bit of that. Okay. Yeah. Good, 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 good. Yeah. Yeah. If you're I around it for long enough, you start picking up on it subconsciously, you know? Completely. I, I'm sure that's what police officers do because they have to, that they're, they're always kind of looking for, suspicious activity and stuff they have to go with a hunch sometimes don't they what do you think they There's pull over the most what in the in america yeah oh uh, would it be pickups still no because pickups uh, 
Not Camrys. No, 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 no. Camrys. No, that's your yeah. perfect kind of like witness protection or yeah. or, or, or like state line running, drug yeah. running car. Camry's um, at least staying a mile an hour under the speed limit. Oh, yeah. yeah. Camry guys yes. aren't doing anything. Yeah. He's yeah. Got, do you know Maybe. Do you know this? Because I feel like you. Oh, what about, it. would it be like, would it be a Challenger or a, a Mustang? Or? Ding, ding. Char- Challenger or Charger, for sure. Is it? Yeah. Is it the hula? It's the hooligan activity, though, isn't it? It's the. It is. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the. I, I, I think it was before COVID was the last report I saw, whatever. It was like far and above the most pulled over vehicle. Mm. Yeah. I do like them though. Oh yeah. I mean the, the new challenger that's not even new anymore. I mean, what, sh- how, how old is that shape? It's over a decade old, isn't it? I think. It is. Yeah, it's really like a 10 to 15 year range. Which is amazing. Amazing. Considering it's still so, so handsome. It's yeah. a good looking thing. It's really neat when it came out, but. Like you just need to scale it. It's just big. It's just big. It's like a hundred fifteen percent too large, you know. And we're around the classic ones more often, so yeah. You, know, you always have a Cuda or a Challenger, you know, a seventy, seventy three, something like that in the shop, and yeah. it's such a gorgeous car. And I love the the design, the look of the new Challenger. It's super cool in pictures. Yeah. And then you stand yeah. next to one, and it's like this bulbous. It's just bloated. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's your next project, guys. Surely you slit it down the middle, and then you take a I don't know eight inches out of it and then you you shorten its wheelbase a little bit and then yeah, before yeah. you know it it's it's one of those cars which you you have to park it next to another one for people to go oh my god you've completely remodeled it the That's problem it. is yeah. though is the motor the motor they wouldn't be that eight inches back through the hood because i think they built the motor and then had to build the car, build the around, car it. around it and the reason it's Probably. so big is the damn motors it's literally what 40 something inches 45 something inches tall is it really that big? It's a big-ass motor. It's a monster. We struggle packaging that. All day long, we're building custom chassis, working off body scans and CAD, and everybody wants a Hellcat or a red-eye motor in some yeah. sort of early Mopar. In a Cuda. In a Cuda. Hammered. Four, four inches off the ground and get it tucked underneath that flat. Can I put turnies on the hood. front of it? Yeah. 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 Shit. They want everything. It's a struggle. You yeah. get a motor that if you put the oil pan on the ground, the top of the motor is like four and a half feet. <laughs> But they want to keep that under the hood, and they want the hood to be a foot and a half off the ground. Yeah. So it's that whole physics thing that doesn't work. How out do we them. do this? Yeah. yeah. God, well, I don't envy you for that. I don't envy you for that. So That's, when you when um, you started doing your own thing, where I mean, obviously you had connections. You've been in the magazine. You've been in the industry and stuff. Did you have a kind of a yeah. plan? Did you start like you had like you know a, a little napkin drawing of like these are the first you know ten guys I'm going to reach out to. This is the stuff I'm going to do. Did you have your first season mapped out, or was it kind of like you know what? I trust myself. I'm just going to wing it. I did a bit. I was mostly winging. I think what, 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 I, what I sort of wrote down on the on the napkin was the variety that I wanted to get, and the variety would keep cycling. So it would go, you know, like barn find, brand new electric car review, interview with a significant person in the industry, one of my project car updates, round to. Um, visiting a collection or a, somebody that has a, you know, a shed full of interesting stuff and then kind of, and then a modern piston car and then back round again. And so it's the, 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 that's one of the hardest, one of the hardest things is actually I made a rod for my own back by needing all of this content, the, the variety of content, because a lot of YouTubers will just stick to what, you know, one thing and do it really well. Like I'm just going to do barn funds. Or I'm just going to do, um, I don't know, you know, hot, hot rod builds or whatever it is. I don't know because my brain really wanted to bring it all in under one umbrella. I just thought, let's, let's try and do it. Let's try and do it. I, I guess I've been in the industry long enough to have good contacts with manufacturers. So borrowing new cars and going on launches and getting those opportunities was, was there. Um, I've become quite known for a bit of a, an authority on EVs stemming from um, when I built an electric um, drag car, street legal drag car. And then, and then, and then, and then as well as that, I suppose the, the whole, I've always enjoyed watching the kind of barn findy stuff on television and on, <laughs> on YouTube. And I, uh, when we were kids going back to things that influenced us to kind of get into this, this world we used to go to my, my parents never drove a, a particularly nice car and it was always 
a bit worn out. So my dad, who was, you know, was a DIY mechanic. He used to maintain his own cars and he, he always liked to tinker. He's an engineer by trade. So he would pre-internet, of course, this is, if he needed a part for the car, he'd go to the scrap yard, you know, the salvage yard. So we, me and my brother, Greg, we, we'd be going with them. So my mum would pack us off with a, you know, a picnic and say, right, off you go, boys, you're going to the scrap yard for the day. And for us, that was like going to a theme park. Yeah, we're going to the scrap yard. And um, we, we'd get to climb around on all these piles of cars and, and look inside, you know, open the door and look inside these cars. And I remember this would have been in the 80s and there were cars from the 50s there and just sitting on stacks and in hedges. And you're like, this is so fascinating. And I, and I think that's one of the things that got me into old cars and, so, and my brother as well. My brother's now, he almost exclusively works on pre-war cars. So he's vintage car. Um, and yeah, and, I, and, and so it, it wasn't that my parents had fast exotic nice cars they were just a bit old and obsolete so we just used to find the bits for them and what i used to watch dad mend them and i it just sort of absorbed it via osmosis i mean i don't i i'm not as good at working on cars as my brother or my dad but um as i've got older and a bit more confident uh, i've quite i've enjoyed the therapy of it even if it's helping someone who's much better than me but um so you you, yeah. you talked about obviously kind of putting yourself into uh you know your your master plan and and you needed to have you know these four different five different types of content and you wanted to kind of cycle through those um have you been able to as long as you've been doing this now map which one of those hit more so than others and does that change your mentality or is it still like that's fine I'm still going to do this circle I know that <laughs> I know that these two are going to hit you know, higher than yeah. these are, and that's just part of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I still, it's still a difficult science to fully fathom out. YouTube is a sort of big beast, isn't it? And that it, was going to make the next work. question. I mean, it, yeah, it's a big old thing. And, I'm, and we're not a big team here. You know, there's only me and, and one other person full time and the videographers we use and editors are freelance. So if I had a bigger team, I, I would probably be conquering it quicker, but we've, sort of done it organically and the um the ver the variety thing i've noticed there's definitely people are curious aren't they i think when when you're into cars there's this human curiosity of of the whole barn find hedge find you know what is he going to dig out of this field the cu the curiosity of going along for the ride even if the car is not really your kind of car or it's a wreck and it's never going to be going back on the road people live through you, your experience and, and they're personally my favorite things to do because you never really know what you're going to find. I don't do a recce first. I like to keep it, you know, um, the one thing I hated about certain TV shows is the, the sort of engineered jeopardy and the acting. And I'm like, I'm not doing any of that bullshit. You know, it's like restoration shows, which are false. It's like, you don't need to pretend there's going to be a problem. There will be a problem. Yeah. Trust me. Yeah. There will be uh, many problems. Yeah, be a lot exactly. Of and I think it just be honest with the viewer and say, look, it's not all, even the experienced builders are going to run into problems. It's just the way it is. Um, so I think the things which probably are most popular are barn finds and a lot of the sort of latest electric stuff. And then things which you get a surprise on sometimes are, I guess, people's garages, we call car caves. And uh, and we do bike caves as well, actually, but uh, the car caves are good because we don't just do the kind of cliche um, 50 supercars all in a clinical um, <clears throat> workshop environment. We You have everything. You have the person who's got a bit of a rundown farm uh, barn, I watched the one you do with Chris Harris that, and that's just like, he's got things yeah. like everywhere oh, just shoved off in oh, this hole. Uh, and this, it was, <laughs> it was not what I expected. No, it's not, not glamorous at all. It's yeah. not glamorous at all. Yeah. And so, and, and, and those have been a surprise because they can be a bit, they, they, they were a bit of a, what I'd call a kind of lost leader uh, episodes really, where you, you interview someone quite slow format, chilled out interview try and get the honesty of the person across if they're a famous person get them try and get them to chat in a way that they haven't been seen before so as if the camera's not on and you don't have to impress anybody 
and open up a bit. And those have been a real surprise. <laughs> I've, I've really enjoyed those and I'm hoping to kind of do more of those. I'd like to travel. The next aim really is to travel the show a bit. So I haven't been to the States since 2019. I was going to ask and you, are going to come do a tour through here, man? We need to set it I up. Would absolutely, yeah, I would absolutely love to. Because I know I've got a growing audience in the States and and because I have, with that sort of quirky car appreciation, liking American stuff, but also liking European and Japanese things as well, I suppose I want to put some more of that into the channel so now we can travel a bit more and the world's hopefully becoming a little bit normal again um that that's one of that's one of my sort of aims for for the late break show if we possibly can and maybe to do some more shows you know like live car show events we did a couple in uh 2021 yeah 2021 and they went down pretty well but they're stressful organizing your own car show shit is stressful i can i can't imagine we've toyed with the idea of doing some type of event we did for a couple of years did a huge uh like appreciation customer appreciation party out in vegas uh the week of the sema show and uh wow i mean that was that's a lot know, of was no cars but yeah no cars and just trying to you know do something to kind of give back and, and have a big party and stuff and that was an absolute you know monumental <laughs> undertaking and that like he said no cars none of the insurance stuff none of the other kind of crap so we can't yeah that would be that would be ridiculous. Going into it, you talked about you know uh, having your mindset, but the YouTube algorithm and and that whole space. Did you have any idea what you were doing at that point, or was it just like I'm gonna put some content out? This is the place yeah, to put it, and if people like it, they like it. That's what I'm wondering. I'm Go fishing and see what bites. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think it, it. I suppose it depends what kind of a person you are. You, you, you some people are very organized and tactical, and other people are a bit more free. Free form, and I'm probably a bit more free form, um, for better or for worse. But I, th- I had no idea how relentless it would be, and how demanding of your time and your energy. And I, and I suppose when you when you're doing any business, you know, when you're self-employed in any business, as many people watching this will know, and you'll know, is you have to put so much unpaid time and effort in. And it's it, it the the difference between YouTube and like doing television is. TV, you do a set amount of episodes over a set amount of time. You deliver the series, and then the channel puts it out whenever the channel wants to put it out, and there's a there's a lull. And then they might gear up to do it again in, I don't know, two months, three months, four months, five months later. The thing is, YouTube, it's just, a, it's just a basking shark. It's just swimming through the ocean with its mouth fully wide, just inhaling digital content and as quick as you put it out they go yeah that was nice when are you going to do the next one and you're like man it's just me on my own i can't <laughs> keep, i can't keep up with this i've got a family and i need to sleep and i'm i'm dying so i think that that was my that was the thing i hadn't banked on being so um so difficult actually so i really admire the people that i probably dismissed a little bit just going oh they just put content out and then they're just running around not putting a great deal of effort in they're not real presenters they're not real journalists and actually i was wrong i was completely wrong um they're probably working harder than the more traditional media were at the so, same but time it's just, it's bit, I'm sorry like, carry on at the same is that kind of like creating a an endless all you can eat buffet at the same time mm. to go out there and just get as much as you can keep you motivated to come up with something new yeah i think it keeps you on your toes like with any business, I suppose you're always looking at your sort of competitors and thinking, what do we do next? What's the next idea? But at the same time, I made a real vow when I started doing YouTube because I had come from more of a TV background and most people who would start following me initially and taking listening to what I was doing would expect a certain level of production value. So I, on the one hand, I could do a lot of vlogging and self-editing. I did a bit of it in 2020. Um, I thought I probably should have a certain standard that I want to maintain. So if you put this, if you watch this on a big 50 inch TV, it's acceptable. It's not like really, really ultra slick TV, but it's not bad considering the resources you've got. And, and that's the thing, you know, people can be so critical on YouTube with the comments and things, you know, people are quite cutting, but the good always outweighs the bad. And um, 
where when you say to people, look, they'll go, ah, oh, you know, you you, you you didn't film that, or I wish you'd stayed a bit longer. You go, look, I'm paying for this out of my own money. You know, for 20, 2020, we didn't make any money. You know, our, each we were paying freelancers to film it, edit it, try and put it together properly, deliver 25, 20, 25, 30 minute episode, like it was a TV show. That's what I've always said. It's yes, it's on YouTube, but think of it as semi TV quality each time. And going back to my old school roots of, of magazine craft, I'm always trying to do the, do it like that. So yeah, I, hopefully the content will keep staying relevant. And I guess you're always building a, an archive, aren't you? You're always, but I thought, thought about that the other day, you're building this huge kind of back catalog. So people, if they, if they only find out about you today, you can go, well, you've got 200 something videos to watch if you want, just, fill your boots go and have a look yeah that, and, is, that um, is the neat thing about it you've always got even even with the podcast stuff it's as you, as you generate some new viewers listeners it's all there yeah. it just exists forever I and mean, i was on youtube today and i was looking for something a video that we did you know not long ago and i came across like that craftsman series right it was nine years ago and i just happened to click on it just for shits yeah. and giggles and i'm looking there's comments from you know nine years ago it's just crazy. it lives forever on there i mean <laughs> It's a, it's, it's a wild, 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 wild deal. But the, and the it's com- kind of cool. It is cool. And the comments as well, like even back then, nine years ago, I mean, there's still just as shitty a comments as there are, <laughs> are today. I mean, that's, that's a funny, that's a funny thing with YouTube comments. And how, how does that resonate with you? And what have you figured out? What type of person posts a negative comment? You know, like what is going on oh, in your life? I'll go a step further than that <laughs> okay. after that, that question. Yeah, what's going on in your life? What are you doing at that moment that you're like, fuck, <laughs> this, what is that? This sucks. Like, you're well, not supposed- you're not a commenter yeah. at all on yeah, any type of social on, media. Yeah. You're but not going to put a comment on anything. Yeah. No commenter. No commenter. Yeah. Is it, I think... Um, well, if the last three years hasn't taught us anything, I think it, it, the first thing should be it's it's that the old kind of adage of just be kind and just treat people as you want to be treated yourself. And I think that's really important. But then and, then, and maybe consider that someone out there is having a really tough time and they're probably taking it out on you. So don't think too deeply about it. And um, I don't like being criticised. I get quite defensive. So I've tried to get thicker skin. And sometimes I, uh, one, one other YouTuber that I interviewed, he said, write your comment out, but don't send it. Wait <laughs> for like four hours and, and then go into your drafts. And if you're still really fucking angry about it, then send it. That's the same thing but for drunk text. <laughs> it's, it kind of is though, isn't it? And it is. And, then it, and it, it, do you know what? It, it works because it helps you to just simmer down and go, is it worth it? Pick your battles. Should I do this? Well, I, I can disagree with their, maybe their thoughts or this thing, but I can understand yeah. at least the guy saying, I watched this. Uh, I spent X amount of minutes taking it. I want to give my opinion, however wrong or right it might be, sure. right? And then you get the guys that are just getting on there, just like at a car show, where the guy's like, oh, man, I yeah. had one just like it, but it was black, yeah. and it was a Mustang. I know that one's a Camaro, but mine was, actually, it wasn't a Mustang, <laughs> it was a truck. Here, let me show you a picture. <laughs> they just want to, they just, that's just, just a doorway with to talk, right? And so I get yes. that. I don't, I don't think it's stupid, but the thing that I don't understand, right, is... You watch an entire video. You sure. don't have a comment really to say, but the one thing that you will do is hit that thumbs down. Oh, I'm just gonna, oh. I'm just gonna passively aggressive <laughs> dislike that. So you I just gonna, I don't like it or you off. Yeah, I dislike okay. that video instead of just hitting next. Right, instead of hitting next and the thing like you're, you can't make a bad comment. You can't make a positive comment. You yeah. just, you just want yeah. YouTube. Like that's it. You want YouTube to know that you disliked. That video. <laughs> it's going and telling the teacher. That's the one I don't get. I yeah. just don't get it. That's I think it's it's also it's it's sometimes there's always context to the comment and and you feel like you've got to give them a bit more information. So like um, someone would like I, I drove a like a modified uh, little kind of rally seventies rally car resto mod a couple of months ago and it would the weather was the worst weather you could possibly have picked to, to film that car but the owner was really is a really busy guy he said i can only do it on this day so it's this day or nothing and we made it happen and even with the pissing rain i said are you sure you want me to take this car out you know it was quite a 
put immaculate thing. And he said, yeah, yeah, I trust you. It'd be okay. And I was scared shitless because it was quite a vicious car. And, and uh, I wasn't sure whether we were going to get a good film out of it. In the back of my head, I was thinking, this is going to be average at best. We've just got to get it done. And then someone, I was really pleased with how it turned out, but someone in the comments went, you kind of drove it like a bit of a pussy. And I'm like, well, there's, 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 two, there's two things to bear in mind here. One, it's not my car and it's not a manufacturer's car. So if I binned it and destroyed it, it's not, I don't just phone up Ford and go, sorry about that. Can you just send me another one? It's not like a production car. Right. And, and two, so you've got to have a bit of respect. Like this is a guy's car. It's just had him build for three years. It's cost him an awful lot of money and he's trusting me with it. And then, and then, and and then, second, it's like you don't understand the weather conditions and the the constraints. We've we've got one winter's day to film this. You know, it's dawn at half past eight. It's it's dead and black by four p.m. Your window of filming is so small, and it's quite stressy. So we just got to get it done. And um, you know, we're not we're not Top Gear. We're not the Grand Tour. We're not. And I'm not Jay Leno. I can't just go. Let's film this for three days and just pick the best bits. I can't do it. So. Um, sometimes you've got to, you feel like you've got to qualify and go, listen, please understand if, if this was my car and I, I, I would drive, drive it like a bastard, but it's not my car. And I have to have a bit of sympathy for people who trust me. What we've um, found over here in, in the, in the U S and it might, I'm sure it would probably work. The translation would work over. We just say, shut the fuck up. Mm. That's, that's <laughs> the best way. And it yeah. seems like it's usually it, it handles. I mean, it's something we've discussed internally in depth. Right, and it, it it applies to a lot. It you know? seems like a joke, yeah. but if you actually start digging in, into it, that is the answer to most n- things. To ninety nine point nine percent of the world's problems, <laughs> right. and every interaction you have with somebody, and that it goes it goes internally too. It's for, it it applies to yourself. If, yeah. if well, you would just shut w- the fuck I up, I wish you would. <laughs> then. I guarantee like most problems are solved. You don't have to get on there and, and I you, like that. you watched the entire video. You were entertained and you're telling me yeah. that you had to say, Hey, you didn't, dr- you didn't entertain me as well, hard as I wanted you to entertain me. So you didn't drive so, that car. As so, hard. What, so what's the best thing you can do at that Just point? shut the fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> like that's the best thing. hundred percent. I mean, no offense. Yeah. Right. You know what? In the, in the old days when it was, uh, when it was, when it was forums, you go in forums oh, and it can get a bit toxic. Like fights. I, I, I went through a phase of just, just uh, sending them a message publicly with my phone number on and went, listen, you're obviously really fucking cross with me. <laughs> and, should, uh, should we just, should we just be sensible and just phone me? Just phone me and we'll chat about it. Yeah. Phone never fucking rang. Right. Ever. Oh, right. Yeah. Ever. They don't want that. I, they got my number. They still got it. I haven't changed it. But um, <laughs> they're not going to phone you because they're never going to phone you and go, no, oh yeah, right. by the way, Josh, I think you're right. a bit of a tosser. And I think that what you do is really shit. You're not actually as talented as you think you are. They're right. never going to say that. Right. They're never going to say it to you. I think so it's, it's funny. The comments though are funny on the on YouTube stuff. You see, like mostly on our like review videos or car videos and stuff where we're driving and all that. Like it's usually split. Like you'll have half the people complaining about something that's pretty arbitrary, and then the other half of people being like, "No, I, I like this video specifically because you didn't right. wear seatbelts." And then yeah. guys like, "Can't yeah. believe you didn't wear any seatbelts." Yeah, this guy's a badass. <laughs> like, he doesn't give a fuck. <laughs> yeah. like, and it's like the seat. I mean, it, I will yeah. say though. I mean, we are all fortunate. I think I've said this once before. We talked about this kind of similar subject. We're fortunate we're not in the marine industry because the boat yeah, guys. Yeah, they. Oh, Shred man. everything. Really? The yeah. boat guys on like the YouTube comments, the forum comments, really? Facebook comments. It is like, I mean, they'll insult your children, you know? Like, Wait, really? It is brutal. I didn't what's know that. Brutal? What's boat guys? What's, I, what's so bad with boat guys? I don't know. Don't, I, don't get into boat reviews. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah, stay away from the boat reviews. I don't know. But like I watch the wavy boats. Uh, there's a YouTube page called wavy boats. So it, it's, it's great. It's, it's got a, I mean, huge following yeah. and it's all these boats going through this one cut, haul over cut in uh, Miami. So it's a rough inlet, <laughs> you know, and uh, it's just everybody basically making fun or correcting whoever the Anybody's captain or, or owner or boating skills of that guy. Oh, so you know, everyone's like an online mariner now. Yeah, all of a <laughs> right. So you see, you see some guy like come through in like a 12 foot Boston whaler and it's like, 17 foot waves and they're like yeah you ever heard of the word trim before <laughs> you know fucking moron <laughs> like, 
Yeah, dude, yeah. it's a it, the boat's yeah. smaller than the wave. Like the it doesn't matter. Like what? dude's mid thirties. <laughs> yeah, he's proud to have his first boat. He's got his two kids right. on, and this dude's <laughs> shredding him on his. Yeah, it's tough. That's, that's, funny. Funny. That, yeah. that's a tough crowd. I think we Tell need to start me, doing a. a uh, f- go ahead. Oh. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, carry on, carry on. Carry on. Oh, I, was, I think we need to do a best of comments because we get some really good ones, like hilarious stuff that we'll bounce back and forth. Yeah. And then like do a worst of as well, maybe just to We could just address those guys. them. Yeah. It's, we need to do a special podcast episode of addressing YouTube comments. And we'll call out who says it, what they said, and then we'll and go And our into, rebuttal. Yeah, and our rebuttal. <laughs> Why don't you uh, have a, like a troll party? You know, like you do, do like an open open workshop cars and coffee thing, but only invite the people who, who have sent you the most vicious comments and get them all together. Have a yeah. little have a little party. That's a good idea. And they, and they'll they'll suddenly they'll they'll suddenly think about what they've done, <laughs> and they'll they'll all be around you going, "I'm really I was terrible. I'm really sorry. I really like you. This is great. Uh, thanks for inviting me to the party. I'd rather I'd rather do it online. I don't know if I want to meet any of them in person. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was going to ask. The, I was going to ask you about like what what are the sort of to you what what are the kind of up and coming um, classic American cars that you think maybe haven't haven't been put in the limelight yet and 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 deserve to be or you can just see the start of these things coming maybe uh, the next kind of good resto mod or pro touring type thing or. I'm always interested in the sort of lesser known. Everyone knows about the, you know, the the the, the sixty nine charges and the of seventy course. challenges and all that stuff. Yeah, but I what think about for the lesser spotted stuff. Us, it's probably always been like generational, and it's just yeah. what was cool when you were in high school. So that's always like a constant moving target. It seems like now yeah. it's just getting into the the Fox Body Mustangs and the IROC Camaros and the Grand Nationals. I don't think they're yeah. there yet, but that's I think what's coming next. Yeah, less on Fuck. less on a actual body style or a couple of body styles. I mean, the trend wise, I'm. I mean, we've talked about it a couple of times. I'm still blown away at how fast and how popular it's gotten. And I don't think we're even tipping the iceberg. The vintage four wheel four wheel drive shit yeah. is yeah. going <clears throat> fucking nuts. It is. I yeah. think it's going to be the like it's, the Hemi Cuda days. It's yeah. It's like a gold rush right yeah. now. Yeah, the vintage four wheel drive. <laughs> Uh, you know, GM, Ford, Dodge. I mean, it doesn't really matter, but classic, uh, you know, 60s, 70s, four-wheel drive trucks yeah. Uh, yeah. is absolutely, it came out of nowhere well, it's, of how fast. It came, how, out, it came out of nowhere, but it's a lot like what Phil just said. It's generational. So that's the, st- when we were all kids, yeah. that stuff was so bad. That was the most badass. Yeah, Everyone's we dad weren't, had we a square weren't, body truck. Right, and, we weren't messing yeah. with the muscle car. I mean, car guys were, you know, yeah. but like, that's what was cool. So, I mean, right. that's, that's, it was affordable back then. Is that what it was? It well, was, yeah. but, well, it was, it was certainly affordable back then. It was, it's, but it's also still what the, the badass guy that had a little bit of money had, like he had that black, <laughs> had that black Cheyenne four wheel drive pickup. that wasn't a, the ones we looked at that were yeah. badass weren't beaters. You know, it's like, holy oh, shit, yeah. that thing's fucking awesome. Right. Yeah. And it was like, if you could put two Rancho shocks on it with a color coded oh. boot, <laughs> fuck yeah. it. You put yeah. six of them yep. on it, you know, put a bunch of shocks on it. So <laughs> right. we were in that, like, you know, we grew up in the late eighties, early nineties. So that was like, TSL you know, Thornbirds. Yeah. Bigfoot yeah. monster trucks yeah. were in their heyday. There was a lot of very rad stuff. So that's, I think that's coming about right now. But I think in addition to that, it's the lack of a trend that's trending right now. It's, you can do anything. Right. It's, it's that everybody's followed the, I've had a Camaro, I've had a Charger, I've had everything that is trendy. I've, I, I went through the hot rod phase and had a high boy 32. And now yeah. I'm like, well, I want to do something that nobody else has. So it, that's what I think guys are exploring, like Barry finding the, the Catalina 2 plus 2. You know, nobody yeah. had really done that's one. A great, it's, it's a great looking car. I think it's a great looking car. And you've got, it's, um, it's fun for us because you've got more and more people looking at doing, I mean, it's a little bit of a challenge because you certainly don't have all like the you parts. You can't buy the off the shelf right, stuff. Right, you can't, you don't have all the yes. parts that, that, that transfer the stuff that you've engineered, but. Uh, but even more so than just uh, cars uh, and models, stylistically wise, it's a wild west. I mean, it's the, it's, if you execute it uh, to the highest level. Yeah. Or the best of, at least the best uh, uh, that you can do. You can go really any genre right now. If you wanted to build a 69 Camaro, you know, with an LS and deck it out and make it look like it 
could have been a Copo. If you want to make it Copo style and not full blown pro touring, it's cool. If you want to go full blown pro touring with carbon fiber everywhere and you know the baddest forge line wheels, you can do that. If you want to do you know a vintage four wheel drive and make it Napco style, you can do that. If you want to do fucking pro street right now, you yeah. know, and make yeah, there, there's nothing that's people are gonna be like, what you did that. Yeah. If you do it, like if you, and it's even cooler to step outside the box. I mean, the the whole OBS truck that we just did, embracing that '80s style was. Yep. Everybody well, fucking loved that. It's like yeah, it, that's it, that's hot right now. It is. That's it's it's a cool spot to be in the industry right now because it's like everybody's just hanging out. You know, it used to be like you've got the rat rod dudes. You're like, don't fucking go near those guys. This, this is like, don't, don't wanna, you don't want to mess with those guys. That's right. It and, was tribal. Right. Very and, tribal. Yeah. And now it's, you know, you've got like Alan Johnson was digging on the OBS that we did. I mean, Alan yeah. Johnson builds the most high end, you know, Riddler winning crazy over the top stuff, but he's down with that. Everybody seems to be embracing a little bit of everything, which is cool. The, e- the, yeah. the egos are dying out, which is great. Uh, cool. Yeah. Cool is cool. No matter the style and styles, I mean, we, you fast forward. I mean, you rewind back 12, 15 years ago. Well, you're just, dude, honestly, like, right, you're just rambling right now. What you said, you said cool is cool. That's, yeah. all, that's all you needed. That, right. Like, that's it. That's, yeah, you, <laughs> Absolutely. Co- you, that says it all. Cool right? is cool. Cool is cool. Like, you, but we wouldn't cool. have, we, cool wouldn't have cool, step, we wouldn't have really stepped too far outside the pro touring box. Nobody really did. You know, you would, you would tiptoe over here. Think about the Nova and how many people crushed the fucking front grill because it wasn't, it didn't fit their narrative or anything else like that. That, those times have changed. Sure. Now it's yeah. pushing the envelope and trying something new. And if it's like, again, cool is cool. Yeah. Well, let's flip well, flop this. My, my, probably my, my most popular project car is, is my Austin Allegro Civic Type R. So that's, basically Britain's most hated car of all time, which I always had a bit of an affinity to because my grandparents had one, my auntie had a shit brown one. And when I was growing up, it was it was one of those cars which everyone loved to hate. All right, we're Googling this. Uh, uh, yeah, what what got, was it again? We, we've got to look Austin, this up. Uh, an Austin Allegro, A-double-L-E-G-R-O. Okay. It's um, a lot a lot of all aggro, as people used to call them. Or, like a um, Chevette, almost. It yeah, was, I mean the Chevette was a better car in terms of um, <laughs> like it, it, it has rally pedigree and stuff like that. But the, you know what? It, this was our this was our AMC Pacer. So if you think about the attitude to the AMC Pacer now, they're sort of ironically cool, aren't they? They're, it, they're fetching money. Yeah, it kind of looks like it's like something that would be in a children's book, like when they, they're yes. they're illustrating a car. <laughs> you know, it's a car. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Stuart car goes to the yes, doctor, and the car goes to the city. <laughs> so it was it was one of those cars where if you're if one of your grandparents died and you were 17 and you just needed a car even then you wouldn't want to drive it it was given to you for free and it had you know it was road legal and in good condition you'd still go no nah, probably stick to my bicycle <laughs> that's right so what and, what are you doing with this thing? yeah because i'm gonna go back to josh's comment about cool is cool and yeah i don't know this fits <laughs> well, or pr- pr- I always pr- said pr- I want to build a sleep. I want, I want to build a sleeper um, Allegro. I love the whole sleeper thing. Okay. I've always thought an Allegro needs it needs to prove some people wrong. A lot of I've, a couple of cars I've owned over the years where people have gone, you'll never make that cool, and I've just managed to do it. I think, and in this case, I started building it and going. Well, it needs to be quick, but I, it's an original paint car, two elderly lady owners. So it's got the elderly lady dents in it and parking issues. And um, yeah, we in the end, we've gone for a, a, a Civic Type R K20 um, Honda engine, but we're hmm. turbocharging it. And, um, oh, and we're going cool. for, yeah, fully independent um, coilover suspension and... The interior, we, we, I've trimmed the interior with um, the same fabric that you get on the London underground train. So like the New York Metro or the LA Metro train. It's so super high, short. super high end then, right? Yeah, really high end, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, there's, it's like an irony. The whole thing is is laden with irony, but it harks back to my childhood growing up with them and everyone taking the piss and me going, I'm going to do it, but if we're going to do it, we're going to. I want it to actually handle and I want it to go and I want it to be fun. And then when we go to a show in it, people will go, oh, my gosh, it's the Allegro. It's the, it's the Allegro Type R. 
So uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to dude, this thing's gonna be. I could get, I could get down with it. I mean, I yeah. like, I like that concept. I love taking weird stuff and doing, yeah. s- you know, sleeper builds. And when anytime you start a project and the tires sticking fifty percent of the way outboard of the body with you know mini lights, yeah, you know it's oh, going to well, be pretty cool. Yeah, the, the guy that's fabricating it, he's I've influenced him to build to buy a shit old car as well. <laughs> so, they, so that beige one is called an Austin Princess, which is I would say is even worse looking than an Allegro, and that was like an executive mid seventies British car, and that he's put a Jag. That is a basically uh, the chassis and the subframes and the engine and transmission from a Jag S type, so a modern Jag S type, which is um, <laughs> v, so three liter V six, six speed manual, fully independent rear end cradle, and and he's putting t- uh, twin turbos on that. So that's going to be a hellraiser. That yeah. car, the Allegro looks uh, way cooler. Yeah, the, I think the Allegro's it's it's oh, not, oh, there's the there's the upholstery there. Dude, the I, I love it. Oh, you, the, we, it's but it's it's everything that was wrong with the seventies, but kind of brought <laughs> into the twenty first century. We've we have a similar project that's kind of like hanging right now that we may or may not do. We have a customer we're building an AMC uh, AMX for. That's a super oh. it's a super rad car. We're getting close to wrapping up the fabrication on it, but he's got a it's like a seventy one Hornet. So I it's, know Hornet. Yeah, Hornet. It's a very similar car. It's like lack of all style. Right. <laughs> so what do you do yeah, with it? Make nice, it, yeah, yeah, make it like a wild, you know, rad sleeper, like a street fighter kind of deal. So we're trying like, that's going to be great though. Yeah. Yeah. The Cause it of, takes customers like that with money and guts to go, let's just go with it. Let's do it. Yeah. You've got to rock it with conviction. It's a bit like uh, people that dress really strangely <laughs> and they go out on the street and they rock it with conviction. They don't give a shit what you think. And oh, they, yeah. go, they go with it. Yeah. And if you go with it, you, if you go with it long enough, people will go, do you know what? Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's that, how that's how trends start. Yeah. Speak, exactly. Speaking from a guy who was driving a '70s Cadillac around London, staring people in the <laughs> eye, doing his. <a> <laughs> <laughs> I promise you, I'm not creepy. I promise. <laughs> and it's, it, yeah. That, so I, I I I love the whole left field thing. I think it's great. And, and I had an AMC Pacer weirdly in the UK. The Pacer's cool. I'm, and I yeah. dig the Pacer, the Mirthmobile. I, w- I wish I hadn't sold it. I would like a Gremlin, but I think the Gremlins have been done quite a lot. I've always yeah. thought a nice the, pro street Gremlin would be good. The Gremlin, it's like, it it, w- it used to be kind of like ironic and it was weird, but like everybody's done something with them. You know, like we always talked yeah. about doing something. There the was old a grim puppy. Yeah, the old grim puppy. There was one where it was down the street from here, wasn't it? In the back, some guy's like backyard. Yeah. We used to go to lunch. And you'd see it. And I think it had side pipes and everything on it. It was like sitting just behind like a chain link fence. We were always talking <laughs> about it. gremlin. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking the Yugo. I, the Yugo? Bring the Yugo back. Oh, yeah. the Yugo would be a good shout for a sleeper. That'd be a great one. You could piss off Corvette guy with that, yeah. couldn't you? I feel like that's an easy, like good. The Hayabusa motor. Yeah, that's what I'm, if you go on YouTube right now, I guarantee you somebody's Hayabusa swapped one. I want to do. I just want to do high end SVX, Subaru SVX. But <laughs> it's already high end. No, I want to make it with with power uh, and, and and stuff like that. I think that uh, it already looks like a million dollars. Make it. Pastrana had the best quote it. on that in the video. It's, it? it's like the future, but in the past. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. It is. It's the eighties future. Yeah. That's yeah. what this is. Isn't it? A window that no, rolls up car. into a window. That's the oh, car. A window yeah. inside a window. Yeah. 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 Crazy. Uh, well, ask a couple more questions. I know we're getting a little late. Uh, so you've you've done a lot uh, on on your show uh, with EVs and and new innovations. What yeah. are what are some technologies that you are most interested in? I guess coming more mainstream or starting to implement in modern cars. And don't give me the standard, you know, uh, ADAS systems or any of that kind of stuff. What what is something that that really is exciting to you? Well, I mean, I think I think the problem that we have at the moment is on the one hand, you've got, you know, ultra efficient EV drivetrains and really in good battery techs, so, but, you know, obviously batteries are becoming more potent, smaller, easier to package, but they're sort of putting them in the wrong cars because a lot of them are SUVs and cars that are just really, when you, when you really sit there and analyze what a family needs to go around in, it's probably not a car that's that shape. So... I'd, I'd like, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to see 
that advancement of the EV drivetrains in smaller but premium small cars. So cars that just because they're smaller doesn't mean that they're less comfortable or luxurious. And um, and of course, with a smaller car, you almost have to be a bit more creative because you it, it's constraining. I don't know if you've seen the Honda E, but like the Honda E was one of those cars where it was Honda when it when Honda does it right and just tells everybody to fuck off and just go, I'm going to do it my way watch this and it'll probably not be a sales success but we're going to do it anyway let's just do this and they do it like once every decade honda do they just go wild like the crazy christmas party in the office and they go yeah watch this watch this uh, and, right um, right to the hr department you know you got <laughs> Ned over there that. the- that's right yeah watch I'm this tomorrow that. i'm gonna yeah so i think i'm i i'm really interested in seeing the smaller more fit for purpose kind of EVs with, with luxurious interiors and the, the, the whole um, recycled and different types of textures and materials internally are are so exciting because I'm just bored of black leather, gray leather. I I mean, leather's okay, but I think I've just seen it and like, it's not premium anymore because you can buy quite a cheap car and you get leather as standard. So then therefore it sort of resets your idea of what is, what's luxurious and what's premium. So I love it when people are coming up with these, you know, the, the recycled fibers of, of bottles and, you know, reclaimed plastics and like, like the BMW i3, the bloody car's nearly a decade old. And yet the interior still looks like something out of a spaceship. It's so interesting. Um, so that stuff really, that re, re, re-engineered interior space that that electric cars allow you to do you know the because of the packaging of an ev you don't need a prop shaft like you used to and you don't need a an exhaust in that way and it gets rid of all that and allows designers to hopefully be a bit more bold with the proportions of a car and so that we can we can we can be a bit out there i mean some of the koreans um kia and hyundai or hyundai they they're just going wild at the moment. They're self-medicating. But the, the great thing about that is that it's it's a mad-looking car, but underlined with practicality. So it's not just silly for the sake of being silly. It's it's a genuinely useful car. I've got a I've got a theory or a, a potential direction that I'd like the auto industry to go. I'm going to run it by you. This is the first time it's ever been talked about. I, this is somebody I can tell by his accent that this is somebody we can yeah, trust. Know. Right? We can <laughs> we can trust to run this back. I'm excited. About yeah. This. So. All right. So everything with, you know, obviously we've talked about EV, ad nauseum, you know, everybody's got their own opinion back and forth. But at the same time, all they're doing is just yet another thing over the last 30 years. It's basically just trying to divide everybody. So every you've got to have something that's so, so polarizing that you're like, yay, EV, EV sucks, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, And it's just another issue and another thing to bring up to separate people. I think, one, we need less cars. Less types of cars, mm. less models, less this. Now, everybody get together. Let's embrace the EV thing. Also, let's embrace big motherfucking horsepower, right? Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> big LS, big Hemi, 800 to 1,000 horsepower, right? Gas burner. Sure. Right? With a three to four gallon gas tank. Okay. And, oh, and, you know, a decent, range you don't have to have a lot of horsepower in your ev you know it has it has 350 to 400 mile range standard gm tesla whatever it is you know ev power plant right so yeah yeah. if you want an ev great no problem but guess what it comes with 850 horsepower hemi and i promise (laughs) you when nobody else is looking it's got three four gallons of gas in it you're gonna you're gonna get on that thing you're like yeah it's uh, that's pretty fucking fun. Right? I quite like that idea. You're sort of rationing the fuel. So you're saying you can use the V8 at some point. Exactly. But choo- choose your weapon carefully. Choose Everybody gets what they want. Because me, at the same time, we're all the same way. You're just going to put a bigger gas tank in it. No, well, I'm going to get on it a few times. But at the same time, when I'm just driving the back roads and stuff like that, and it's just commuting to work and all that stuff, I don't have yeah. to listen to the big V8. And if, if I'm just going to drive six miles and stuff like that to get to work it, early in the yeah. morning, that's fine. I'll let the I'll let the you know the electric part take it and you know when I leave the parking lot I'll probably get sideways. Everybody is happy. Everybody yeah. sees both sides of the thing. You gotta save it up like your nitros and Ivan Stewart's off-road game. Yeah, you use three <laughs> nitros. Yeah. And, 
Dude, that's the problem. It's, that's it's the that's problem with you, man. Yang. I mean, that's why like that. that's why you are a bitch. Because <laughs> I'm fucking going all the way home. I'm putting a, a, a fuel tank in the back of that thing, and I'm ca- that Hemi is cackling all the way home. Well, yeah, dude, I'm just <laughs> on it. Say the inside things well, outside. Okay, there's all kinds of stuff we can do on Sorry. the aftermarket. I don't care. After the yeah, thing. If, 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 the, right. If I got to run to Target to get some something, I right. don't care. I'll walk in there just reeking of 110 <laughs> all the time, <laughs> yeah. no matter what. I'm good with that. 110, yeah. 110. <laughs> I think the other thing about the, the the way the industry is going, which I hope is going to happen more, and I and I think should happen more, is I feel like there should be the renaissance of the uh, the coach builder. Sure. So you know, back pre-war, of course, you know, you'd order your chassis and then you'd go to your whichever body m- manufacturer and you'd pick a body for whatever purpose you wanted. They'd tailor it for you like a suit. Why don't we go back to that? Uh, we could do that with the electric car era where if Tesla stops building full cars and just said, we're a chassis provider and you can buy a a rolling Tesla chassis, skateboard chassis, you can tweak it, certain damping and stuff like that, and maybe rear wheel drive, front wheel drive, whatever. And then you'd come to a coach builder who'd go, right, what do you want? Allegro. I I want an Allegro. I want to put I want an Allegro. Allegro. Uh, but But you can, you could go, well, I want a 70s Jeep Wagoneer, but I want the body panels to be made of composite and I want, you know, the wooden sides to be 3D printed. And I want the interior to be made of, I don't know, my old grandfather's favorite chair that is so dear to me. It's all a load of random stuff, but suddenly you'll have this complete kind of interesting Frankenstein of a car that you can use every day, perhaps as a family car. And it rewrites all the rule books. Like you said, it it doesn't divide, it it will divide people, but people will go, oh, that's quite cool. Right. I mean, that's that's awesome for people like, you and I think people like us that have very like eclectic taste in the automotive genre. Like you come up with camera guy, but no, not the forget about the camera guy. He'd be fine. He's like, just make it look like a car, like an RC car body that you just put on the top. But like (laughs) kids today, I mean, imagine what the high school parking lot would look like. You know, there'd be <laughs> yeah. these giant, fuzzy, pink, furry, looking Unicorn. crazy unicorns yeah. that like Anime they're characters. shooting rainbows <laughs> out of the top of them and doing like, I don't know, it could be like it some of that. a video game, but dri- be driving to work would be like a video game, wouldn't it? Right. It, but it would be like some of the Porsche exclusive manufacturer stuff where that's a good example. Like, oh, green wheels with yellow brakes and some pink piping and green and blue plaid on the interior. I think those that's, guys are just doing it to fuck with Porsche. You think so? I don't yeah, think I they think. really like this. I things. wonder if they'll do this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I've seen some terribly specced Rolls Royces, and you just think, "Wow, that was like four hundred grand," yeah. and it looks like somebody's painted it with nail nail varnish and. <laughs> It's a terrible idea, but I mean, it, it, it takes balls to do it, I suppose. But yeah, I think the, the future is interesting. It I is. think all that we've just talked about is is that the, the future is bright because there's there's less boundaries and there's and there's more creativity and the dawning of all this technology that we have, like you know, the, the the 3D printing, the laser cutting, the all of that stuff is just so amazing for the old car world. And maybe young people, like I think about my son who's eleven. He's not an old car purist. He likes the Dodge. He likes the smell of it, actually. He said, I'm a bit worried about him. <laughs> goes, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't use it every day. It yeah, no, don't let him sniff it too much. It's, it's, no, <laughs> no, he goes, he goes, Daddy, I, I do like, I like the smell of the Dodge, but he said, but not for more than about an hour. After about an hour, it smells a bit too much. I'm like, yeah, that's, it's probably yeah, a bit too noxious. It's, it's enough. <laughs> but it's, yes, yeah, an hour. That's okay. Let's just do an hour. It's cool. But, uh, well, we're going to, we're going to, Go to a few standard questions. Oh, you got some? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Before we jump okay. into the standard questions, I'm just curious because you're you're a guy who's obviously been in tons of vehicles. You review all kinds of vehicles. You're around a lot of really interesting stuff. Very difficult question, I'm sure to answer. But what's what's the most badass thing that you've driven, or something that's a huge standout? You know, something that was like a once in a lifetime opportunity, or for any just, reason, or yeah. Just, any, well, just it, whether drivability it's drivability or anything, yeah. Okay. Just the stand. Oh, wow. Well, uh, I always, you know, when I get put on the spot, I always forget some of the stuff I've driven. It's bad, isn't it? I've, um, there's been a few highlights. I've been in two of, at the time of this was two of the world's quickest street legal cars. So they're you know street legal drag cars that um that were at the time were seven second second seven second cars, and I've done and, and as a passenger 
on the street and then on the strip in those. And that was mind blowing because I'd never experienced power like that. And that was really good. And I've done, I've driven a, a C type Jag, you know, an X works C type Jag on the Mille Miglia race event, you know, the, the new, the newer yeah. version with the owner who was basically, he was, he was getting cross with me because I wasn't driving it hard enough. And I was scared because cool. he's, yeah, because he's like, and he casually mentions it's worth two million pounds, and I said, "Well, that's the reason why I'm not nailing this car around because I don't really <laughs> fancy being the guy that goes backwards through someone's front garden <laughs> and in the two million pound car." So, but it felt really good because we were driving it flat out a lot of the time with just white shirts on, sunny Italian countryside, but you know, chasing Alfa Romeos, Gullwing Merc with some mad Germans in trying to overtake us on blind corners. It was like being in a 1950s film car chase yeah, it was, cool. it was so be awesome and there i am in the passenger seat and i don't even really fit in the passenger seat because it's so small with no, there's no i don't think there was a windscreen maybe a tiny fly shield with a, a map that i couldn't really couldn't really read very well a, a big big bucket of strawberries that, that we <laughs> gotta, went through. Gotta, we, gotta we, have them, we man. Through, gotta have them. We went through, we went through a village and, and these, these, we, we were slowing down for like a checkpoint and these women would give you a bucket of strawberries. I was like, that's really kind of you. Thanks. But I've got nowhere to fucking put it. <laughs> so if I had a bucket of strawberries, I've got the, I've got my map and my, the, the driver's going, where to next, where to next? I'm going, well, hang on a minute. I'm just, I've got nowhere to put them because there's no room in a seat top chair. Have a strawberry. Let so, me figure it out. Yeah, I was going to say, I, so I ate loads of strawberries. Um, so that was really good, That's cool. and um, and fairly recently I've driven the um, the Rimac Nevera, which is the uh, like a Croatian hypercar, uh, yeah, um, yeah, I'm familiar, electric, with it. and it was it was so fast. I mean, I've driven quite a lot of pretty fast cars, so I, I, I and I know what speed feels like to a point, but that car rewrote rewrote that for me. It was it just tore me a new one. It was incredibly fast and yet not a race car, you know, it still had luxuries and uh, we drove it on the road afterwards and it just felt fine. But honestly, it just felt like a, an airplane with no wings. It just, I thought it was going to take off. It was so strange. Yeah. Wow. So, um, yeah, I'm fortunate enough to have been in so many odd cars. I mean, the sort of cars that you might be into. And there was a, there's a guy in Britain who's got an old seventies Rover with a, a 27 liter Rolls Merlin engine in it, so a Spitfire engine, and it's street legal, hmm. and uh, it's bonkers. He drives it to France. He, uh, he drives it to France all the time, um, but the engine's so massive because you know that massive V twelve. It, it um, you sit at least halfway back in the car. You sit the the bulkhead is so is so huge, and uh, he built it all himself in a shed. He's you know quite an eccentric guy, so that was that was really that was really memorable. That's I enjoyed wild. that a lot. And out of everything, yeah. so I, I actually came across uh, your YouTube page organically, um, and I stumbled across your, you did a, an episode with uh, Gordon Murray. Oh, yeah. Which is pretty mind-blowing. I mean, that uh, yeah, that supercar that he's got is unbelievable. What, yeah. What was that deal like? And did you get a chance to, like, pilot it? Riding it, I've not, I've not yet. I've been promised to go in it, and I'm holding him to it. Gordon's great because the thing about Gordon is, I suppose, a bit like Jay Leno as well. It's you know that he's really into cars. There's no egos. It doesn't matter if the car's, a, you know, a small city car or a you know, low volume mad supercar. If the story's interesting or it's been engineered well, he's into it. And go, going to Gordon's place was really, was quite, I was a bit, I felt intimidating at first, but he's quite a softly spoken guy and he's, you can tell that he's interested. So one, when, you, when, you, when you start to engage him, his eyes start lighting up and he's got a PA and his PA is often saying, look, you've got, you've got 10 minutes with Gordon and he's got to go. He's busy. He's, he's got stuff to do. Sure. And then, and you knew you were onto a good thing when you were already 20 minutes over what they said you were allowed to film. But, but the camera is still rolling and nobody's shouting yet. So just keep going, keep going. Yeah. And um, I remember I first met Gordon because we were, we were, we were both kind of presenting at a, a classic car show on stage. And I, for some reason, he overheard me talking about a Honda S, S800. 
to a friend that's just saying, oh, what an amazing little car that was for its time. And he went, Are you, if you got a Honda S800 at the time, I didn't, I actually have owned one since, but he said, I've got, I've got one of those. He said, it's still one of the greatest cars I've ever owned. He said, I can't fit in it. So I had to have the seat um, re-engineered, but he said, it, it's a wonderful car. And, in, and then reeled off all these facts about the car straight away. He's quite rain man with his, with oh, yeah. his knowledge of, of measurements and stuff. He's, he, he's the sort of guy that knows the wheelbase of every car that's ever been made <laughs> in millimeters. So, um, yeah, he was just he was just a very very pleasant bloke, and it it took us about a year and a half to organise that feature to yeah. walk around with him in his shed, and then get the feature of driving his um, the Ford Escort Presto mod, and that car's really special because again, it's like Gordon Murray, the guy that invented the hypercar still craves an old 70s, you know, late 60s Ford Escort, the car that was on every street in the UK in the 70s. It's not a special car, but it's special. It has a memory for him and he wanted to build one his way. So that was what I loved about it. And he, yeah, he's he's one of the, he, he, that was a really cool day. It was a really cool day. That's awesome. Yeah, that's right. that. in, uh, in the UK, what's the difference between a shed and a garage? That's a really good question. Um, a shed and a garage. I think usually a shed is is not quite big enough for a car. It's a sort of thing that you put gardening stuff in and motorbikes go in sheds. All right. I wanted That's, to make sure it's the same shit here. And you, can you say shed? Shed we don't yeah. put cars in. Sheds the things we put all the little small things that we don't want in the garage. Yeah, you just yeah. Throw, yeah. yeah throw and I think the problem is, is nowadays you can buy sheds in so many different sizes. And I, I and the first first garage I ever built was actually a shed. Thinking about it, I just specked up a big shed. Okay. And um, <laughs> so it did just look like a big gun shed. But I mean, as long as it keeps the car dry and, and call it whatever you, you want. You, you call it what the hell you can call it a, call it a shit face if you want to. I don't care as long as it keeps my tools dry. But yeah, um, yeah. but uh, yeah. I mean, it's they're, they're important. Gar- garaging old cars over here is so important. I don't know about the climate exactly where you yeah, are, it's, but it's rough. We're pretty similar yeah. to where you are. Yeah, it's yeah. You can't. You can't just. Gets. Yeah, you can't. You can't leave a car out all year round if it's a classic. It just it'll deteriorate quite quickly. But. We'll get into um, some of our standard questions so we can wrap this thing up. I know it's a, a little later there on the on your side of the pond. Uh, Don't you worry. I'm enjoying it. Oh, awesome. Like, well, we'll like keep rolling then. Uh, <laughs> so w- excluding Bullet, because you've already kind of tipped your hand to that being your first major car chase scene. So we're going to take Bullet out of yeah. it, right? Generally, yeah. we, ask, we ask guests, what's your favorite car movie and a reason why? So we're going to take Bullet out of it, right? So you Bullet's can, out. Bullet's out. Bullets out of it. Um, and you can say ba- favorite car movie or uh, second favorite car chase. Oh, okay. Well, um, the favorite car movies, Ronin's got to be up there. <laughs> I knew it was going to be Ronin. But it's it really unpredictable, and I'm, I've got to try and be a bit more interesting. I think the thing about Ronin is it was just when it came out, I watched it when it was new, and I just remember being blown away. They don't, by they the don't know Ronin. I've never seen it. So before. this is the reason I oh, know shit. Ronin and why I was going to go with it, because when way back in the day, um, I also oh. I had a side job. I was I was selling uh, home audio at a place called Hi-Fi Buys. Right? This was yeah. about the time when Ronin had just kind of came out that was the thing is that we utilized is that, that what you wrote on the back of the trailer I that was what we utilized to sell some of our from our high-end home audio right okay. so ronin the ronin chase was the go-to for you know pioneer and clips and some of the speakers and so like that that was the go-to surround thing. sound was oh that yeah the, that was your, yeah wow. that was, i would love that's a great idea it what was a great idea it was awesome to shoot that was right when pioneer first came out with the very first plasma TV. It was a like a twenty seven inch. It was I remember nineteen thousand so dollars for this little plasma TV. Nineteen thousand dollars. Yeah. Wow. For the plasma TV. So the movie's got great sound effects. Oh, it's got a great audio. It's a it's a is it's it, an M five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an M five BMW, and I mean they're running yeah. through. Is it better yeah. than the opening scene of Days of Thunder? Can't as be. far as audio. Trick question. Goes? Well, you watch it uh, on la- <laughs> so you watching on a laser disc? Yeah. Oh, hundred. Well, if you're watching, you're watching on a laser disc, <laughs> then they- <laughs> yeah. Joe, I was only talking yeah. to someone about Days of Thunder yeah. the other day because I, I I said to them, I said, unpopular opinion, I preferred Days of Thunder to Top Gun. I thought it was a cooler film. Yeah, yeah. you're correct what? on that. 
You're correct. I, yeah. I watched I it this it weekend. Just, it just resonated you, with yeah. me a bit more. So I was 11 when that Do Days out. of oh, Thunder yeah. on, on a high-end home audio. Yeah, on LaserDisc. Yeah, it's on a, laser yeah. Disc. <laughs> Interesting enough, I've never seen the original Top Gun. Never seen it. The original? Yeah, I just, I just never cared to watch it. So you, this yeah, you're Days I, of Thunder I, guy. Yeah, I was a Days of Thunder guy. I did go and see the sequel in the movie theater, which was awesome. How have awesome. you never seen it? I've just top, never seen it. Now, I mean, it top, I may have, uh, I may have picked up like bits and I've never sat down Days and of watched Thunder's it a better movie, but beginning Top to Gun end. is a fucking phenomenal yeah, yeah. movie. I don't have anything still. against. Yeah. I don't have anything against yeah, it. I just because the sequel dude, was really good. Volleyball the beach scene. Really you you don't even know the reference to volleyball beach scene. Then you've got a scene. <laughs> Tom, no, I, Tom dude, Cruise playing volleyball with yeah. his shirt off. Yeah, I've seen Side oh, Out. Wow. I've seen the movie Side Out. I didn't need to watch that. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, 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 going back to Ronin. I think the cool thing about Ronin is no CGI. Um, the, the only time, perhaps in film history, where you'll see Ro Robert De Niro in an average French Peugeot saloon car. Uh, looking like he's going to shit himself, looking terrified. <laughs> well, funny, uh, funny, en funny enough to me, Ronan, the movie itself, what was so intriguing way back then was that was the first kind of mainstream movie that they even had anything about like a modification to a vehicle. You know what I'm yes. saying? That, yeah. That was like a thing, you know? And the fact that they're like, you know, because I'm, I'm into cars at that point, and they're like, oh, and this is like you said, Robert De Niro. This is big screen. This is as big of a movie as it gets. And they're talking about modifications to this. I'm like, oh yeah, I know that. It's, I, I know what you're right. doing. It's the Audi S8, isn't it? The yeah. line about the Audi S8. So exactly. They, they, they need they need to steal an Audi S8 as a sort of getaway car. And the driver says, I need something. I need one of these S8. I need traction. I need power. But I'm, I need to make some changes or something. And he he references I'm going to need nitrous, double shot, or something like that. Yeah. And you go, what? And an S8? I mean, that would be like a rocket. Yeah. At the time. What what year? What year era is this? This would be nine uh, late ninety nine or two thousand two thousand one. I should look it up, shouldn't we? We yeah. need to be professional. Yeah, look yeah. It up. let's look it up. I'm, I'm going to go. If, I'm if we're to super professional, I'm, I'm going. Have... Hold on, I'm going. I'm going. 2000. Go? I'm going 2000. I'm going to go 96. That's just oh, that's way on. too early. It probably is. Hang on. 98. Yeah. Oh, 98. Get right in the middle. That's pretty good. Yeah. Wow. It's seriously. It's. I wish I'd not seen it yet because then I'd get that experience of seeing it for the first time because the car chase is so authentic and it's the oh. difference of the cars. You've got the Audi Quattro, the S8 versus the BMW M5 versus the. Um, the Mercedes 6.9 SL, SEL, uh, with, with uh, what's the guy? He, does he have a bazooka? Right? He's got some mad gun out of the sunroof of that car. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they do a very, firearm. like, you're yeah. always. I'm excited to watch you, this. You this always sounds... geek out when we're talking about doing our awesome. video on the tactile sound things, whatever, so you can hear you yeah. know, the shifter sounds. It's not just right. all motor, right? It's, it's motor, tires, brakes, okay. shifter, yeah. pedals, uh, even yeah. hands on the steering wheel. There's a lot of. A lot of good it is, sound isn't effects. it? Yeah, it's well, it's it's really really good. So was, that's definitely up there. That's I gotta watch it, man. What was that recent movie? At, and I feel like we talked about this before with the Testarossa, the red Testarossa. It just came out recently, and the dude like spun it around backwards and ripped the door off. Oh, and it yeah, and then they picked it up onto a crane. It was some mainstream movie. I don't remember this. It can't on. have been a real one. Was it a Toyota MR2 or something? <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it looked very Zero. authentic. You know? Did it? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was, Is it like the James Bond DB5, you know, the the one that gets shot at and sm it's smashed a, up? and Yeah, kind of like, the, I mean, it, yeah, red. It was a red test. Click on the picture on the left. What? Infinite? Infinite, yes. Okay. I haven't seen that. Infinite. I've okay. never heard of it. Yeah, great. Well, that's the film I need to see. So yes. you need to see Ronin. I need to see Infinite. Great car chase scene. I mean, it's one of those where it's like, it goes a little over the top. So Jer Jeremy's a huge, he's, that's, if you're going to talk about pinnacle car, top of the list, it's a Testarossa. Yeah. It's a Testarossa for Jeremy. That's his. Well, Good taste, Jeremy. Uh, the old flat twelve. Um, what a what an engine! The, a, fr a really good friend of mine's just come back from going skiing in France in his Testarossa, so he uses it. So winter here, right? Early January, <laughs> put it on wind, put, put it on winter tires. Ten days ago, yeah. skis on the roof. It's a grey one, gunmetal grey. It's a really good spec, and he drove it with his wife from here 
down to the Channel Tunnel, across France to the ski resort, up up the uh, to the Alpine Resort, skied for a week, drove the bastard thing back, no Damn. problem. That's yeah. like an, there's, that's there's, like an ex, videos that's an extra in a James that's, Bond movie. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. somebody you like. You're so something's happened in James Bond, and it's just the you know that's the husband the, and wife in their Testarossa going to ski yeah. in France. That's the kind of thing I want to I want to say that I did. Like well, I you just can't. yeah, I just yeah, went up and I went skiing. <laughs> In the He's TR, a you know? well, that that's that's how cool Matt and Betty are. That's how cool they are. That's I, awesome. They've right? off, they've offered me the car before. He said, oh, "If you ever want to borrow it, just borrow it." Just he said, "It's he said it's the one of the most reliable classics I've ever owned, and yet it's an '80s Ferrari. I don't understand." Have you driven one? So, no, I've never driven a Testarossa. No, no, I'm pretty sure I haven't. I've been a passenger in one, but not a. Um, I've never driven one. So no, there's a few cars I've not driven like that. I'm always that guy who's like super respectful of like the auction cars. You know, like when you're at, yeah. we go to Barrett Jackson every year. We're heading out there uh, next week, actually in Scottsdale. But you know, you don't mess with anything. If you're not going to buy it, don't don't touch it. Don't don't go near yeah. it. But I find myself standing there next to a red '89 Testros, and you were there, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm looking at it, and I'm like. I got I to gotta sit in it. I got to sit in it. I have got to fucking sit in this car. And I did. Yeah. I mean, very respectfully. Is it, is you know, it, slid my, it slid myself blazer? in there. No, but it, oh man, it felt cool. Are you, uh, are you ever going to, do you think you're ever going to get one? Do you think it's the, is it the thing which is, is it like uh, um, on Wayne's world where Wayne wants that guitar? Yeah, will it will be mine. Will oh be yeah. Mine. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to be, and then I'm going to be, I'm going to tell, I'm going to gather Josh and Phil around. I'm going to tell him that I'm feeling saucy today <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to pull the trigger on it, but I'm, I'm particular. Like no stairway, Wayne. Yeah, I'm particular. It's got to be, it's, it's got to be white and I'm white on white is realistically what I'm looking for. Wow, yeah, that's make, it, so, uh, make is, it more rare. Okay. Yeah, Bianco. Yeah. Are you, w- would you buy a, a crash damage one and rebuild it? You know, like a, I, with your skills, or I, I'm trying. I, I'm trying to use a lot of restraint. I'm going to say no. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I, yeah, I know myself. So if that happens, then it's getting like you know a modern Ferrari motor with crazy. It's, it's just gonna it's gonna be a million dollar Testarossa. Right? Yeah, you just need one so, that's too nice yeah, to fuck with. Which nice enough to drive. I know myself well enough to know I'm trying to find the thing that I won't fuck with i'll just yeah enjoy it yeah and i'm having a hard time as is that. yeah well that's kind of like where i'm at with my dodge if it, if it happened to be a numbers matching car and it's a manual and it's a 383 but a lot of people are like oh you, you know you should have 440 it or you should he- hemi you know modern hemi it and i'm like well if i bought it with no engine in it uh incomplete car then it'd be a different story but that particular car is just it's just nice the way it is it's 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 weathered um it's we've mechanically rebuilt it and it just it sort of tells a bit of a story and that's the, and that's why I, I like putting miles on it and i don't mind parking it in a supermarket car park and if somebody runs a key on it or opens a door onto it it's okay because it's already got some marks and dings and scratches on it so it kind of looks it's sure. just part of its part of its character when it was 10 years old i i gave it a, a 10 year birthday present and i i gold plated one of the bumper um, I don't know what you call the override of the bumper over bumper guards, uh, little bumper. So them. it's got a little bumper. So it's one of them's now gold, like a gold tooth <laughs> nice. just for its 10 year birthday. It's Cause it's a bit of a nasty looking car. So it's a bit sinister. Oh, what do you got? You got a 440 in that thing or what? <laughs> do you know, does, have you ever watched Joe dirt? The movie Joe dirt. No. Oh, you're no. going to have to give that one a watch too. <laughs> Dude, that's what I'm thinking. He's over here talking about how he's got this like patina Dodge charger with a, 440 or something and i'm like in america how we portray that is yeah. joe dirt yeah like, it's joe dirt. over there it's like that is dude he's very eclectic he's it's got da- he it's has david yeah, spade. It's yeah david he has spade great movie. taste it's like man he's he likes these american cars you've got to watch joe dirt and that's a title <laughs> yeah. make you check. or maybe don't I it's a great look joe dirt yeah. it's a, it's well, a great suppose, movie yeah i think it's um i don't i mean if, if it wasn't in the if it wasn't the sort of co- p- condition that it it was with interesting patination and stuff i would have i would have would have painted it almost certainly but it um i'd love to find out the history of the car actually i didn't i didn't i, I imported it myself from san diego but i don't know its proper history I, I believe it was it was a san francisco from new car which is probably why the back end was rotten but in my in my dream head i think oh it was somebody bought it after watching bullet they ordered it 
and then they ordered it with non non servo drum brakes all round and and non power steering and they nearly died every morning on the way to work <laughs> in San Francisco. <laughs> is that is that your tip of the spear? Is that your uh, Wayne's World guitar car? What is? What is the it, one what's, you will what's, have what's your one day? Stairway to Heaven. Which it will, but there, there's a few. It will be mine. So I've never. It is a bit cliche for a motoring journalist to want a nine eleven. I would love a, a nine, an early nine eleven, or possibly a three five six. Because to me, the three five six is still one of the prettiest silhouettes of any car. It just, it just looks right to me. I love it. I think that's fantastic. So that's a, that's a bucket list car. Um, I need to hook him up with Rod, Rod Emery and just get, you know. Test yeah, get out of my system. Build. Yeah, yeah, just get it out of my system. So that's definitely up there. And I think there's probably a couple of American cars, but I just need to finish the ones I've started rather than kind of delve into more. Dude, your wife's not going to listen to this. It doesn't matter. You can just say whatever okay. you want. Well, <laughs> do you know that it's, it's, it's a really it's a really odd thing to want. But if you remember the the old '60s puppet series uh, Thunderbirds, I don't know if you're familiar with the no, Thunderbirds. I don't know the Thunderbirds. So in the 60s, this sort of, uh, they, they, these people, uh, they created these kids' TV shows with, with realistic puppets and real pyrotechnics, and it was quite pioneering for its time. And one of them was called Thunderbirds, one of them was called Stingray, and one of them was called Captain Scarlet. And in Thunderbirds, the there were, there's a sort of um, oh. a fe- a female, like, secret service lady who's a bit saucy, and she drove around in a pink Rolls Royce with six wheels, with like a futuristic bubble top. And it was it was made up, you know, it was all made up and it was a scale model because all the puppets were about, I don't know, 18 inches tall or something. And ever since Thunderbirds, um, hmm. I've always thought, I need to build one of those. There is one in existence. They built a full-size one for the promotion of Thunderbirds back in the 60s, but I don't know if anyone's ever built another. So I would love to build a six-wheeled roller with a bubble top just like that, it was called Fab One. The number plate, I think, said Fab One. I'm gonna be honest and, um, with you. That's that's a that's a pretty out there one. Yeah, that's well, that thing. <laughs> that's out there, that's, isn't yeah, it? That, I've, I've always had a thing for six wheeled cars, even though yeah. I know they're a bit shit and a bit pointless. Josh has <laughs> Josh has been talking about taking his H2 and doing a like a six by six by two? yeah. But I wanted six I wanted by four, four wheels in the front. Yeah, you like wanted the them elf, on the, like the Elf car, like the yeah. the race. But you wanted them on the oh I thought you wanted them on the back that has them on the front yeah I wanted them on that the has front. them on the front that yeah. steers that's two steering axles yeah because I'm not gonna I'm not gonna ride around in a Hummer H2 with six four wheels on the back that's a douchebag move I'm gonna I'm gonna put them on the front where <laughs> everyone's <laughs> like oh he's he's so, cultured uh, so everybody can see them oh well, yeah he's could cultured. you go eight could you go could you go eight wheel or is that just Ooh. silliness dude put it on madness? put it on fucking if you did, tank track if you did eight wheel you could yeah. you'd have to do eight you know eight wheel steer. No, would that's you going go on be tank tracks. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, that, that fits your. MO I don't know how better. we didn't think of that before. Yeah. That is actually a track. absolutely look, going on tank tracks. <laughs> it would look good that on actually, tank tracks. That actually sounds pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> not, <laughs> not the bolt on four tank tracks. You're talking. Yeah, just no, one actual tank side. Tracks. Yeah. an actual tank. You think uh, with a pivoting cab? Oh. No, that's shit. A, well, we that's 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 a flex because the bolt is this happening? Yeah, the four is like a. He found a kid, he bolted it on. The two, yeah. like, traditional it's real deal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, It's like, this dude knows what's going on. He's, he's got something it, special. It, 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 you better, you not, you you better not build me one like that. And seriously. That's you better not. You, better, <laughs> you guys better not do that. If, if uh, going back to the chat about, um, like, old-fashioned um, kind of trucks and uh, those SUVs of the 70s, and they, or they're not quite SUVs, what are they? Off-roaders. Um I'd have a, a scout, an international harvester scout, is it? Sure. Yeah. Quite quite like those. They're not quite as popular as the Bronco. They don't have the the prestige of the Bronco. Yep. But I think I, I know I've probably they, there's been a few good builds of them, but I'd quite like one of them. A friend of mine in this country's got a international harvester pickup from the early fifties, would it be? Early mid fifties. He's had it years. Huh. That's quite a rare groove thing. Yeah, here they're they're, those, but... they're pretty readily available. I mean that the scout is like the most common barn find vehicle or like yeah they're always the side of the barn yeah everywhere they, oh yeah it's when you're outside. out west like go th- yeah. through wyoming that is the one vehicle that's always in like just behind the carport it's just what's crazy yeah. is this in that i mean i don't want to go off into a tangent but it's so funny how because there's we talk about this with modern cars today and old there's never a car that checks every single box perfectly the no the, the scout it's it's so far superior 
to the Bronco. Yeah, it's a better, in, it's, in a better build build, quality, yeah, it's a better and, built quality and size wise. It's way, it's way more ergonomically right. correct on the inside, but the outside, yeah. then it's got some weird things going on that makes it just a little bit ugly. Right. And the Bronco yeah. looks better. Yeah. From looking yeah. at the Bronco. It's like, I feel like the Scout's the checker cab version of the 55 <laughs> yeah. It's You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Like in comparison. Something's a little bit off, but yeah. you don't know what it is. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's cruel. Poor yeah. thing. Yeah. I, uh, it's still a 55. Like your check, checker cabs, are they, are they collectible and stuff? I've always quite liked a checker cab. Not at all. basically in not, every 80s film, yeah, isn't it? Not, every 80s movie. Not collectible at all, though. No. Yeah, I think they just crush them. I don't know where they go. That's a shame. Yeah, they, go to, they go to NSRA and somebody puts a small block with no, a No, they go it. to Back to the 50s, Minnesota. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Crow Street. <laughs> <laughs> what about the um, those airport cars they used to make, like the eight-door stretch wheelbase? Have you ever seen the, you know, the airport limousines that they used to do that were factory built? They used to do like um, Oldsmobiles and there was a Buick and they were a factory car and they just had eight, yeah, eight identical sized doors all the way along. And they used to do airport runs in them. Oh. And the, I one came up for sale in Germany about two years ago. My friend was threatening to buy it. Um, <laughs> nobody, nobody, nobody wants yeah. it because it's a bit of a liability. You know, you've got three times the amount of car to restore. Yeah. But yeah. Such a strange I've, idea. I've never seen it with all the doors. I mean, I obviously I'm familiar with like the limousines of the you know, 70s and 80s. I was actually just eyeballing one on bring a trailer a this morning oh. yeah early Did 80s you? or mid 80s uh cadillac limo just was it bad mint. was it good oh i mean it's i i i want to buy it to daily drive it but i don't like, have i would have i want somebody drive to drive it yeah. for me but like i want it to be my buddy so we can like hang like i want to hang you know like <laughs> chill in the back switch off is it like the one is that the one like the one in die hard is it die hard where the limo driver is out in the car park i'm trying to remember oh, which yeah. film it is yeah, yeah. die hard and he's, he spends the whole film just sitting in the car waiting yeah. Yeah. to be told yeah, when to pick somebody up it's like your classic die hard's a great movie square body would you call it like a square body cadillac yeah yeah, yeah. It's a, that would be the, that's like a box a bro, yeah. or like a brougham or a yeah. broham broham yeah broham yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. My uh, my 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 Caddy Fleetwood was a was a brougham, bre- brougham. I don't even know what it means, but it was it was one. It mi- uh, means you better lock it up at night if it's a broham. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah, it means it's, <laughs> it means it's super nice. <laughs> uh, next up, what is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Oh. Um, um, well, one of them is an, is an obvious one, which, uh, I've been told a few times cause I'm a bit of a procrastinator and I'm going to write it down. I'm going to have it as a thing on the wall. It just says, you just haven't um, gotten it, to it yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It, it's just, if you do nothing, nothing will happen. And it's like, Oh sure. yeah. And it's so stupidly obvious. So that was, and then, but the best piece of advice I ever got when I first started working on the TV was um, a, a, um, a producer was chatting to me and he said, right, he said, there's going to be days when you're tired, you don't really want to go on camera, you've got to like bring the energy and just get through it. But he said, the one thing you must never do, don't ever piss off the people around you that make you look and sound good. Don't do that. And I really remembered that because I've heard there's been people that have burnt, you know, the crew just because they're in a bad mood or maybe their ego's got a bit too big or something. And I, and I always thought, yeah, don't do that because their job is to be, is to make you the presenter look and sound the best you can possibly be without, without them. You're nothing. (laughs) If you could go back, if you could go back in time at any point in time, what time would it be? And what would you tell yourself? Oh shit! I thought you were gonna say like just pick a time. I don't have to be alive or not. Oh no, you gotta be um, alive and you gotta tell yourself. I gotta be something. alive. Um, oh, that's a good one. That's a really, really good one. I've never been asked that before. It can't be. Don't do this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it is. 
Um, it's probably, uh, it's probably, it's probably um, the night I lost my virginity, and it was probably like, listen, this isn't going to be as good as what you were hoping it to be, but don't worry, it gets. It does get better, and you hopefully get better. And 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 by the way, in in about fifteen minutes, she's going to cry, but it's not for the reason that you think. <laughs> it is. That's the best that's, one we had. That's hilarious because as he's saying that, I'm yeah, sitting yeah. here thinking, myself, I'm like, I've never, I've never been asked that question. I'm like, I'd be like. Yeah, dude, go for it. Like, she's down. <laughs> she's ready. <laughs> well, I, I, I remember it, and it was a strange night, unfortunately. Um, but, hey, you live and learn. You live and learn. <laughs> yeah. I'll leave, you, I'll leave you on a cliffhanger. Well, you feel like... And that was at a, do you know, that was at a car show. Yeah, that was at a, that was yeah. at a car show in a caravan. Romantic times. Oh, a Dodge yeah. caravan? No, no, just uh, like a, you know, oh, you guys call them trailers, you know, like a static Ew, caravan okay. thing. All right. Yeah, so it was classy. Really classy. <laughs> I, think we drink, I think we were drinking cider as well. Yeah, classier just, than, uh, just to make classier than the backseat of a LeBaron. Man, for sure. was, I was going to say, if it was his, it was a Chrysler caravan and yours was a Chrysler LeBaron. Yeah. Oh, the LeBaron. Uh, see that, that there's an irony car. The LeBaron, I mean, they were, the, they were so shit, weren't they? The, the well, the I, you know, whoa, whoa, easy, whoa. Now. We're, we're taking a, <laughs> taking a, south, <laughs> taking a southward <laughs> turn here. <Yeah. laughs> That's a the yeah. K car. You guys call them the K cars, is that right? Or K cars, K cars different. Yeah, we I believe okay. we called them the Lebanon, which is made it yeah French. Yeah, it Sounds wasn't it's a little bit nicer. French though. Yeah, just dude. because you say it in our house it was. <laughs> yeah, it's a soft R Lebanon. Like you just Le Baron. Le Baron. Le Baron. It's like a, that's the sort of car that there's a stereotypical like. <laughs> what does the person look like who drives that? And it's like everybody in our high school. <laughs> really? Yeah, that yeah. was that was the car. Yeah. Of, I mean, it, my, my first girlfriend had a LeBaron. Everybody <laughs> around in the in the mid '90s had LeBaron. Go to. It was yeah. like a affordable convertible two door. It was really the only. It was the Toyota Camry of the day. It was. Yeah. It absolutely was. Yeah. But a drop and it top. had it had yeah. bow uh, infinity. Sorry, not bows. Infinity yeah. stereo. Tell you, Maserati really? used it as the base yeah. of their sports car. Maserati, yes, that's, yeah, yeah. The Maserati I mean, basically just stole made all, their name off of it. Yeah, they, they stole the Maserati the whole was shebang. Going a low patch. <laughs> they stole the whole shebang. They put a little opera window in it and, and a hard top. Yeah, put their name on it and boom, <laughs> Maserati. That's, what is the worst? Oh, there's a there's a there's a there's a Cadillac which was based upon a, um, a German Kitera. Do you know what? The, the, <laughs> do you know, do you know the, the the Kitera is actually the the, the, the the car it's based on is actually a good car. In the UK, a lot of people used to buy those as budget drift cars because there's a really, really good steering angle and they're actually quite good control on the limit. So you can you can take the piss. But I actually thought. This, I know they're hated in America, aren't they? The Katera. I haven't. Not worth anything. I haven't seen one since a year after they came out. So since like really? 90, 96, I haven't Brian, seen one. Brian Hoder's mom had one. Did he really? Yeah. I remember that. I had, you need to find just, one. Oh my god! You I, need to find one. I, we had them as police cars over here. Did you? So really? they, they were. Yeah, there were police parts that you could fit on them, and they were quite hot. The three point two six speed manual, limited slip diff. Damn. Cop huh. cop shocks. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they're, they're quite good. They're quite handy. Cop yeah, tires. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. I, had a I had a good buddy in, in high school, uh, middle school. Uh, his, his dad actually just passed away about uh, three or four months, uh, three or four weeks ago. Uh, but growing up, we were young. I remember him telling we had, we had just met. Like This was like freshman year. He had just came to the school. I just came to school. We met and uh, started hanging out, you know, be kind of becoming friends. He's like, hey, you want to come hang out at my house this weekend? And... Uh, yeah, no problem at all. So if we're we're headed up there, and he's like, you know, my dad's got a Maserati. I'm like, oh, so, so you got money? Well, well, then it ended up being that Maserati. Oh, that, no. oh you got taste too. Yeah. Dude, that square front of a Delorean, basically the front of a Delorean, like the rest That's of it. Right. And, That's not the one. So it's an awkward beast. When you you bring that up, that brings up like. <laughs> crazy memories for me my like my early racing career i <laughs> racing i basically career. yeah i basically came came to it i honed myself in a maserati is a racing <laughs> car we called it so i he would probably know more what this was so a friend of mine alex litchfield 
his dad, he was one of those dudes. You know the guy who had like the old ass dad? <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? His dad, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so ancient, ancient dad. Yeah. yeah. His I, dad, I, I, you know, we were kids. We, yeah, we were kids. I had just turned 16. He was 15. His dad was like yeah. 97 16. years old. Right. Yeah. yeah. But, and his dad, he had uh, like some cataract deal going on. He couldn't see well. He was almost <laughs> blind and he kind of wasn't real, real with it. Well, in the garage is a... Uh, You're painting quite the picture. Yeah, yeah in the garage... In the garage is this... Leaving broken hearts in every right. town, yeah? Yeah, in this garage is this Maserati. And my friend, he's telling me, he's like, yeah, my dad has this Maserati. It's like a sports car. And I... But, you know, he... Like, he just... The car just sits there. He says, like, do what you want with it. I don't know how to drive it. It's a stick shift, right? I'm like... Well, oh. yeah, dude. I'm like, let's rip this thing. You're in luck. You know, I'm like, I know yeah, how to drive a yeah, stick you shift. You are in luck because I taught myself how to drive stick shift on my brother's 70 Challenger. So I'm pretty good at it, right? Well, he lives in this brand new development. You know, it was like all those like row homes, twisty, tur- like curvy roads and everything. All I remember is that the shift pattern is a little weird in them, right? Isn't it like first is like back and down or something? Oh, is it a dog leg, like a dog leg first as we call it? Yeah. So it's where second normally is. Right. So right. We're, we're running right. through this thing and I'm like, oh, this is awesome. Like it's compared to a, a 70 Challenger with a four speed. Yeah. I mean, dude, this is a lot more gear. It's like a Formula One car, right? Yeah. I'm just rowing through yeah. gears and we're driving this thing around and I'm cranking. So now we start. Yeah, you know, we're, we're doing laps, right? And I'm getting faster. You're getting and a little, faster, little faster. cocky. A little yeah, confident. you're getting cocky. You come around the back. You come around the back straight, right? You money shifted it, didn't you? This is just like no. in your like friend's neighborhood. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Friend, when you're 16, you're not <laughs> thinking about shit we do in America. Yeah, so we, we roll off. I come around and off the apex, and I'm in it, right? Second, third, fourth. I mean, I'm probably doing 65, 70 miles an hour. Goose. <laughs> goose in the middle oh, of the road. an actual goose. Goose. Yeah, a real a bird. A real goose. So a single goose. Yeah. A geese. A, yeah, goose, but, a single, no, single but goose. But we, goose. yeah, right. We had been, I'm, I'm, we're clocking lap times, right? I'm trying There's to, I'm trying to best my lap time. The goose is not going to prevent me from besting my lap. I mean, I hit every corner. I ape I'm coming down this, that home stretch. <laughs> goose what, has wings. Getting, you can fly. This, you, this you episode may, is getting demonetized dude, for you, sure. You, you may have to cut this. And my friend, he kind of gives me like a, dude, dude, hey, dude, there's a fucking goose. Fifth gear. <laughs> Never check. The goose won't. No, Boom. No, shit, no, sh- no shit's given with the Boom. goose. They won't back yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Fuck goose. The goose. Exactly. We, but go- geese never back out. Yeah, yeah, the goose wasn't backing out. And neither, and neither was I. So they don't. They I'm don't. glad you know exactly right. what we have to deal with. I do. I do right? the, the, the far, there's a local farm to me, um, and um, instead of having a guard dog, they have guard geese. I kid you not. Oh yeah. Because they said that they make no noise and they're they're bold as fuck. They won't give up. They'll just yeah. come at you and they'll they'll hiss and they'll they wake the dead. So oh, yeah. he said it's it's just better. They're less maintenance than a dog. Let's have, yeah, have but they are things. not no bolder, match for a Maserati. Not bolder than a Maserati. It, it did, did, did dude, damage the Maserati. No, not at all. Just right under feathers everywhere. <laughs> I mean, across the whole thing. fucking neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. You should be ashamed of yourself. I am. I Yeah. As a 16-year-old kid trying to, you know, set record lap times. Yeah, what was your lap time on that? I, I don't remember now. I mean, but... I still can't believe you're doing 60 around a neighborhood in a borrowed Maserati. Well, it wasn't That's mine. So, <laughs> like, like, what's the worst right. that could happen? <laughs> what, the, yeah, meanwhile, the old dad who owns it can't even see it. Yeah. And he's just hearing yeah, this he thing can, being screamed yeah, around can, the estate. He see shit, so we're all good. Like, <laughs> you always I've got a question for you guys. <laughs> just thought. Yeah. We're talking about cars which sort of should be cool again, but they're always being kind of pushed out. Station wagons. Awesome. Come on. They need that their, 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 their time their time is now, surely. Yeah, yeah they're awesome. I, uh, what do we think. I had spent way too much time looking out the back window of an eighty six custom cruiser. And the oh, carbon yeah. monoxide. Took, yeah, because it had that little wing, and then that back window that was power. Oh yeah, uh, that's right. We picked, we picked up that was it LTD. Yeah, it was a 1986 Oldsmobile Custom Cruiser. Oh, yeah, we snagged oh. uh, Impulse by on the way home from work one day. Me and <laughs> me and my buddy Impulse. picked up uh, an LTD for like six or seven hundred bucks. Mint, oh. absolutely mint. It, it's like a five five point oh. It had yeah, it's it a looked, five liter beer. The motor looked like a fucking. Fox body Mustang. Because it was. Yeah, yeah, it had the same intake yeah. and everything. 
the thing was awesome. Dude, I mean. You should have, you told me you kept it. We, well, well we, we kept yeah, it you're for not a while. Hear this. But a lot oh, like. Oh, gosh. A lot yeah, like that. He's a little rough on the old cars there. A lot like the Dukes of Hazard thing you oh, got shit. going on in the back. <laughs> Very no, similar you didn't story. didn't do that with it, did you? We yeah. did. Did yeah. you? Oh, yeah. And it was a lovely, like, old person worshipped example. Uh, absolutely yeah. mint. Oh, you bastard. Mint. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <Hell> yeah. <laughs> sent, we sent that thing. There are some great pictures of that sucker just flying through the air and just folded it. In folded the snow. It up. Yeah. yeah. Really, you bet you bent the thing. It, yeah, it they tackled they, the whole car. Yeah, they don't jump. Uh, they don't jump like they do in the movies. Yeah, amazingly yeah. enough, they it's a little nose heavy every time. Just <laughs> <laughs> poor thing. Yeah. She bananaed it. Oh yeah, this. But that era station wagon is what your mind goes to. Yeah, um, but I mean, Phil, you drive a station wagon every day. I do. I daily a station wagon. Yeah, Phil's, do you? Yep. Yeah. What have you got, Phil? I got a Audi RS six. Oh, sweet. You've gone in at the top. Okay. No pissing around there. I think that's yeah, more of a shooting in. break than it is, it, a, isn't it? It could be a shooting break, yes. Yeah. That's, it's a, yeah. it's a, that's the far... It, which era is that? Is it V8 twin turbo, V10? Yeah, or V8 th- twin turbo with the 21. Okay. Well, that the, when they first did the V8 twin turbo in the early 2000s, I'm going to say, like 2003, so yeah, 20 years ago nearly, I... Was we were doing a group test on what that and a couple of other really fast cars from magazine like Performance Car of the Year shootout thing, and um, at the end of the shoot, the editor said, "Look, this has got to go back to Germany." It was on German plates, really early version, and he said, um, "Johnny, do you want to drive it back to Germany?" I went, "Yeah." When he goes, "Oh, but tomorrow," I'm like, "Yeah, fucking too right." I was just, you know, single guy, early twenties. So I had, I just had money for fuel and a ticket for the, uh, the channel tunnel to drive, a, drive across to, to France. And I was like, that, that was de- de-restricted. It was the, the plus model. And, um, that's still the fastest I've ever driven a car legally on the road in Germany on the Autobahn. I got 187 out of that, 188. And Damn. zero up, up to about 130, I was with it. There was a couple of Spanish guys in a Ferrari. I forget which Ferrari. I think it was a 456. And I absolutely blitzed it. And then uh, over 130, I could just see they start. They were starting to come in then, where the aero of the, the Audi was starting to get the better of it. But we, we, would, we were playing around for ages on this huge deserted Autobahn. And then after, I don't know, 10 minutes of that. I, and I pretty much ripped through half a tank of fuel at that speed. <laughs> um, that we, 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 we were all slowing down because there was some congestion coming towards a city and they were like, respect. And because it had a dog guard in it. I remember, I think the, the first time I've ever driven that fast on the road and I look in the rear view mirror and there's a fucking dog guard. That's I'm thinking I'm not even in a supercar, I'm in a family estate car with a it's dog, like a, dog it's guard. It's like a roll cage. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. Awesome. honestly, it was, it was, it's just such an impressive car. They still are. My, it's still so impressive. If you if you put your hand up at the wheels from the top, from there up, my H2 looks like a station wagon, right? <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. It's just like a boxier version. Something like that. It's the Volvo. H2. Kinda. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you well, Andrew has 47 Volvos that he drives he's to work a, every day. He's got a lot I was going to ask him on Saab, but you're going to ask him on Volvo? No, I'm more no. A, like, where do you stand on the Previa? <laughs> <laughs> Prev. Uh, well, do you know the thing about the Prev is... Um, they're owned by a certain type of person in the UK, people that like having lots of children. And um, they are really hard to kill. So the, the, the you know, the, you, you guys, you guys have demolition derby yeah. type people. Yeah. We call them, we call them banger races over here. So, and banger racing is quite competitive. It's become a bit too feral now. It was feral in the first place. Hmm. And the, the Prev is the weapon of choice for a lot of people because it has, because the engine's quite inboard. It's a mid engine. It's a mid engine, I guess. It's, yeah, it's yeah, mid engine, yeah, right? Yeah. It's a mid engine rear wheel drive uh, exotic be- might be, vehicle. Might be pushing the definition of mid engine, but that's <laughs> neither here nor front there. It's <laughs> right here. Front, front mid. <laughs> and and um, so you, the good thing about it in banger racing terms is you can give it, you know, full throttle head on impacts time and time again. And the engine's still chuckling away no bother because it's right next to your feet yeah but that's where you so, that's where you are <laughs> that's where you are I, know, but it's, I can forward you some videos of prevs putting up with more punishment than you can ever imagine a car and still going yep yeah, i'm still on i'm still all right 
I you're not you're not helping us out because Jeremy's been on the hunt for a Previa. Dude, me and Mike, pre- me and Mike are gonna design like the raddest Previa. Like yeah. super. Can you do a roof s- chop, roof chop Prev. Oh, I'm thinking like, like super car level, like like DTM like, like, wide body. Yeah, basically. <laughs> for, like imagine, picture this: picture Formula One car mixed with. Nerf football. What was the what was the Kodak race car way back in the day? The little was it a Mazda or the MPV? What was the, the MPV? The <laughs> yeah, little, it was a the van. It was a van, but full wide body like. Oh, the the the, the, the Renault Espace F1. Oh, that's what it was. Yeah, yeah, to, yeah. To yeah. promote to promote Renault's Formula One team, they did the, the Espace MPV, but with an F1 engine. The thing was yeah, amazing. Get, it's it's basically it's you take a. Take an F1 car, yeah. put Familiar. full fenders on it, and then just take yeah. the minivan and yeah. stick it in the middle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, honestly, it was yeah, it was, it was central driving position minivan, F1 mi- engine minivan. Yeah, on YouTube, there's a sh- this sh- video of that going around one of the circuits doing like a parade lap. Is that it's what you're going to do with the Previa? You could do, yeah, DTM Prev would be quite cool, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Well, I mean, over I here they're, they're worth they're worth nothing over here. Do you want me to send yeah. you one over? Please do. I'll, I'll I've got to stick, yeah. stick it on the slope. We'll yeah. do. I tell you what, we'll do. We'll do like a swap swap meet. So you you stick on the boat. I don't know a Buick Roadmaster, one of those nineties last of the oh, they're still Roadmaster. We should just do. Like them. We honestly should just do a swap, and that nobody we, knows what's coming. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we do a swap scene. We go. Look, I'll pay the ship in my end. You pay the shipping at your end, and they'll cross the ocean like that. Surprise. And then, <laughs> I'll get uh, you a prev. I'll right. get you a dirty prev if that's what you want. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you want the night like a real nineties one, like the you know the oh, two yeah. door. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Silver. You know, like that kind of like silver, silver blue. with a little bit bluish hue. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I met a guy once who'd stripped the whole interior out of one of those, and all it had was a driving seat and a huge hammock, a full length of the car hammock that he used to sleep in. It was so hmm. random. And he just, and it had, and then like books and of course a guitar in the back. So he just used to like sing himself to sleep or something. I don't I, know but what I had a buddy like that, had a hammock in his van, but he traveled around chasing fish and selling grilled cheeses. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> uh, Interesting guy. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was fun. Uh, last but not least, uh, well, second to last, uh, if you had to give some advice to any future entrepreneurial content creators wanting to get in and say, you know what, I want to get in the automotive field. I want to do interviews. I want to, you know, do YouTube. I want to do Instagram. I want to be an influencer. I'm young. I want to do this. What advice would you give them? Cool. Okay. I think, well, two things, the old, the old saying persistence pays, I think is probably a good one. I mean, I was, I was pretty persistent at nagging people for work experience and stuff to try and get my foot in the door with in this industry. So I think that's always good. And then secondly, is don't be afraid to kind of find your niche. Don't be afraid to be be different. There's so many people that just follow the herd and it, there's only a certain amount of supercar chasing kind of or socially awkward people out there that we need. So go for something different, you know, be, celebrate the nerdy. I think one thing, one positive thing about the internet and the, and, and YouTube and, and, and Instagram and all the social media, it allows people to fully nerd out in a better way than ever. It's cool to be a train spotter. If you do it with conviction, it's cool to like shit, shit cars. If you, if you deliver information about it, celebrate the fact that you like shit cars, you know, I think it's, so I think, I would I would go headlong into find the niche that you're really passionate about. If it's a bit unique to what else is out there, do it, but then just properly go for it. Do it uh, full throttle and and nag people, really nag people. And pr- and before you start talking on camera, practice. It doesn't have to be too formal. I don't mean it because you want it to be formal and a bit straight, but you want it to be like you're talking to a friend in the pub. So it's sort of funny, but at the same time, it's always loaded with good information. It, I re- it really irritates me when I watch videos of people who they basically switch the camera on and then they immediately tell you that they've done no research and they don't really know what this car is. It's like, well, for fuck's sake, t- put the camera down, <laughs> go on, spend half an hour with a coffee and actually look up what the fuck you're doing and then start the camera. That's the way we do it. Because otherwise you're just showing everybody that you're a twat. Right. So you know, just, just, re- just rewind and just think about the way you're doing this. It's just obvious. It's like, why... I wouldn't take a car apart if I hadn't looked up how to take the car apart because it's going to go wrong. 
isn't it? Yeah. Almost certainly. I, I can't so believe we've got, have done that. It took this long to get to the twat because <laughs> that is, and my, my wife's going to laugh at this because we've got, well, one, we've got, we've got two, uh, but two, two like Netflix addictions. And one of them was, uh, Ricky Gervais's uh, Afterlife uh, on Netflix, oh, right? Gosh. And loved it? loved that. And I mean, and we la- they we laugh all the time because because, <laughs> and I I say twat, but obviously yeah. twat is the way you know, twat. it's it's common it's commonplace just in the vernacular. It's just used all the time. Um, and the other yeah. one, other one we won't talk about as far as what we watch on Netflix, but. Uh, it's also <laughs> great. Great British Bake Off is is one of the greatest shows. It is oh, great British Bake Off. I know okay. Paul Hollywood. He's a uh, nice guy. Are you serious? Yeah, uh, I do know him. Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, I, I DM'd him um, a couple of days ago, and because I was watching the Christmas oh, one, dude, I'm, just lit just up. I'm like super stoked right now. <laughs> Forget everything. He's else, really, but... really into his bikes and his cars. I mean, properly oh, into his a, bikes. He's, he's a car a, guy. A He's a oh, big shit. car guy. Yeah, yeah. Damn. He's he loves his I mean he he loves his he's very into Aston Martins, but bikes wise, I think he's more into bikes than cars. He loves bikes. He doesn't talk about it much, but he's properly into them. That's pretty cool. Yeah, he might even own an X Moto GP like works bike. Really? Yeah, yeah, you know, he's he's hardcore bikes. Hey, ah, Hollywood. I can tell you can tell in his eyes. Hollywood fucks. In our Smith and Sniff podcast, we actually did a whole episode once about how this is before. Was it before I met him? We 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 we, we tried to work out what he would smell like if you met him, and we came <laughs> to the conclusion that he's one of those. He's one of those. He's one of those guys that just smells really good. <laughs> you know, you, you you go in for the handshake and you yeah. go, shit, I'm not even gay, but you smell amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it, I could well, see him. You know how yeah, you come across the guys that smell good, but it's overpowering, and you don't. You oh, it's wanna, very overpowering. You don't want to be around it for long. It's but a bit Paul blood. Hollywood, <laughs> Paul Hollywood is the right he's level. Always fresh and clean, smells good, but it's not overbearing. Like you could, you yeah. find yourself going in for a, for just another little embrace for <laughs> for, just, for just one more sniff. <laughs> Just one more at the end of the night. Yeah, yeah, it's really great to meet you. Yeah, yeah. The arm goes in like that, like any, a drunk wedding. Anybody yeah. that's listening right now that's watched Great British Bake Off knows exactly what we're talking about. I've, you guys I've, don't I've, know. Do, do you yeah. think there's anybody listening that has watched Great I've British never seen Bake it. Off? Great British Bake Off is a, is, is a fucking gem. It's the, it's. We, do you, it's do you awesome. know what? But so I, I, I we do a we do a t shirt in the on the late break show called the Great British Break Off. Obviously. Oh Play really. I, I can see it just behind me. I could run over and get one gonna, and show you. I'm gonna have to get one of those. Get one of those shirts. I can send one to you again. We could do a we could do a merchandise amnesty I where think, I send you some across the ocean. You send oh, us some across the ocean. Across. We should yeah. do that. Be easier than the cars. We'll try it's, it. Yeah. Start with this. Yeah, we'll start with we'll shirts. Start with the yeah. We'll start with t-shirts. We'll work up to the car. Then we'll do mini bikes, and then we'll do yes. I don't know strange tools. <laughs> uh, we'll, Johnny, dude, this is this has been amazing. It's been awesome, dude. I've got something. I've got a. I don't want to like exploit the the accent but i need i need to ask a favor of you so of my daughter my daughter's nine years old and it, when yep. i pick her up every night right down the street at <laughs> gymnastics and she's a very colorful personality she loves to f- fuck with me with the british accent so we go back and forth she talks in the british yeah accent. she talks in a british accent she? and she likes to tell him like insult her mother so we go back and forth, and I try to I try to feed her some things. So she uh, the yeah, so we and we can right, right, and we can cut this all out. This is just more personal. I love the positioning that she insults. No, her she does. She like so we go back and forth with this thing, and she says, "Mommy, piss off! That's a bunch of rubbish." And, and then we go back, and then we go back and forth. So can you? Her name's Charlie. You got to give me something that says I'm Charlie, and then insult shit out of her mother what, really, give me really something just give me something well not not insult a not, nine-year-old well, no no not, no not 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 the nine-year-old just give it like your wife he want you want him oh, to okay. insult your wife well, yeah because you got to give her something to say that like hey okay. charlie like okay m- tell your hey, mom charlie, tell your mom yeah. i got you yeah understood oh i'm trying to think of like, something so uh what would i say um Oh, I'm putting you on the put spot, the, man. I mean, dude, spot you gotta, you gotta just flow. You know, you gotta. There's so many options for how you can insult people. You gotta I'm teach her the, the you gotta teach her the twat. The twat. <laughs> yeah. just, so, um, just say, yeah, hi, hi, Charlie. Um, 
don't call your mum a twat. Unless, of course, she is a twat. And then, <laughs> and then, and then you can say, listen, mum, I love you to pieces. You're a wonderful woman. You do so much for me. But sometimes you can be a bit of a twat. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Perfect. That's Perfect. That's all I need. And, then, you... and, 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 and daddy talks out of his toothless mouth. Yeah. He has to stop doing that. <laughs> all right. Perfect. Oh, Thank you for that, yeah. Johnny. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm now interested in hearing your nine year old in, throwing all the insults out. Uh, and it's just very strange. Uh, this what is, on earth got her into that? I, you she know, she that? she's like she's got this crazy personality. So every day it's like we I pick her up from gymnastics right down the street. So I get out of work and it's like seven forty five. I got to roll over there, and she's just got this thing every day. It's like this a new accent, and she's got wow. I don't know where she just picks it up. And Just it's exploring yeah. accents every day. And she's pretty damn good at it. You know, it's kind of fun. Wow. I, she might end up using that to her advantage in a career. Who knows? It, she yeah. needs to use the term, when she's a bit older, use the term piss artist. That's a good one. We, we use that one a lot. Piss artist. Someone's an abs- absolute piss artist. Okay. I, <laughs> like that. I tell you what I've liked. Uh, I heard, I've heard this from Chris before, and I've heard it on other shows too, is, is uh, how, how are you supposed to uh, fuck all? It it means like it fuck means all. it means fuck, fuck all. all. It means fuck all. Absolutely fuck all. It means nothing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I love. I I can't ever yeah. use it because I don't think about it when it comes up. But yeah. I, when I hear it, yeah. I'm like, yeah, my brother says that quite a lot. Fuck all. Yeah. Fuck all. Yeah. yeah fuck all. <laughs> I don't think. Um. I'm. I'm trying to think. Toss has Toss has not done. Not really said much in the states, is it? Wanker's not really a thing. Bollocks. Bollock porridge, that's a fun one. Uh, don't don't talk to your daughter about that. Um, <laughs> that's not not fit for nine year old consumption. That one. <laughs> but, do you know what we did? You know, something that we we started doing at school years ago. You know, we, this is before I knew about what stroker engines were. But we used to call people that were like you know like this. We, we used to call people strokers. So you go, you know that guy that's just like constantly flexing in front of the girls in, when we're playing rugby. It's an absolute stroke. Huh? An absolute stroke. <laughs> and then, of course, fast fast forward, you know, 10 years, 12 years, and people start talking about stroker engine. I'm learning about engines. I'm going, stroker engine? What are you talking about? Is it one of those engines? <laughs> Oh yeah! This there is, we go. This has been really good. It's been we, fun, we had no man. idea what to expect. Um, I think we definitely need to do this again. Uh, love we had to. a we had a great time hanging yeah, out. Dude. Count me in. Yeah. Super Thank cool, you. Well, man. Well, I'm 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 pleased that you you wanted me to come on. So thanks for your time. Absolutely. It's hey, awesome. when you if you put this together and you make a U.S. trip, man, you've got to come up to the Midwest and uh, we'll we'll show you what it's all about. Yeah, We'd we'll, love to do it. We'll put you behind the wheel a bunch of cool American stuff you can rip. You, you can, I'm going to hold you to that. I would love to do that. You That'd got be it, really dude. good. Absolutely. That'd be really good. We'll have to hunt down a Le, Bar, Le Baron. Le Baron. <laughs> Le Baron. <laughs> a Le, Le Baron sleeper, now you're talking. You got There's it. the gauntlet that has been laid for that. Uh, that'd be Gosh. awesome. Perfect. Yeah, we yeah, seriously would. need to do that. It'd be some good content. We'll get a LeBaron here. You drive the LeBaron, and then we'll drive a, a Previa. We'll drive, yeah, Pre- Previa, maybe some of the, Prev- the latest Roadster Shop creations. Perfect. It's like a sort of contraception avoiders car, the Prev. Yeah, <laughs> it's exactly. Just, it's one of those. Yeah, but they are good. They're well engineered. You've got to hand it to them. They're very good. I appreciate oh. it, Johnny. What we'll to yeah. do it again? Well, thanks, dude. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks again for listening to the Oil and Whiskey Podcast with Roadster Shop, an Ironclad original. If you like the show, be sure to leave us a rating and review. Thanks again to our guest, Johnny Smith. We'll see you again next week.